Kaj Larson, Navy SEAL, war correspondent, entrepreneur, founder. So we're going to go into all of it. You can't mass produce special forces. Yeah. So my class started with 246 people. We graduated 26 originals. And we spent the next two decades becoming one of the more lethal military units on the planet. Like I parachuted yeah, out yeah. of an airplane at 30,000 feet, been in a nuclear submarine, slept next to a weapon of mass destruction. If you had told me prior to becoming a Navy SEAL that the hardest part of SEAL training would be... I would have been like, you're crazy. All of the success that I have had in life is due to these formative experiences I had both in training and then as an operational SEAL. They made me who I am. So why did you go into media? So work in media is, yeah. is God's work. I had a very successful career in media and journalism. Kaj Larson, he's a journalist and former Navy SEAL, Kaj Larson. Walk through kind of what you're working on now. Trying to use all my SEAL skills and apply yeah. them to entrepreneurialism. Cheers. <laughs> Kaj. Kaj. And so I was named after a Danish poet, my mom's oh, wow. favorite poet named Kaj Munk. And he wow. was a uh, resistance fighter who was killed in the Holocaust. Kaj what? Munk. Uh, M and what was it? Eastern Europe? Uh, someone. Uh, yeah, was he it? was Danish. This Danish? one. So they would say Kai Munk or whatever, but it's spelled K-A-J. Oh, wow. So my parents always said Kaj. Interesting. And uh, yeah, and my mom liked his poetry and wanted to kind of honor our heritage. That's, That's nice. awesome. That's awesome. Do you have siblings? I have a little sister, baby sister. Nice. She's awesome. Yeah. She's a, she's a doctor. She's an emergency room doctor. Okay. She, she got all uh, the brains in the family and I got the brawn. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we like to say like, uh, yeah, like basically her job is saving lives and my job is taking lives. So oh my God, that's so funny. Yeah. We're, we're a hell of a combo. Yeah. I showed this guy. Can you please take care of him? Yeah. <laughs> do you want tequila? Do you want whiskey? What do you want? Let's do this. Let's let's first intro you. Great. Oh, then okay. We, then we and then we're going to go and decide. We're going to show you all our, our beautiful selection. Yeah. Notice how similar those two are, but okay. We're going to give you a selection in a second. So, um, Chris, um, <laughs> <laughs> what the I have something in my eye. I'm sorry. I have, I'm trying to, I'm tr I hope it's not going to mess up the I, whole listen, thing. I, 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 I can go for a, it looks like Scott, a Chris. It's fine. Don't worry about it. <laughs> no, I have something in my eye. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I mean, I, I want to let you enter yourself, but even before we were talking downstairs, I'd say like Kaj Larson, your life is sort of three different chapters, right? So you have Navy SEAL, you have war correspondent, and then you have entrepreneur founder. So we're going to go into all of it, Perfect. but I think uh, obviously it's interesting to hear the origin story. So what is a, what is a meaningful event in your life, in your past? And it could be at any point, it could be growing up when you're five, six, could be when you're in college, it sort of set you on the path that you were on. Yeah, that's, it's an interesting question. Uh, I think probably one of the things that had this seminal influence on me uh, is that when I was little, my parents, uh, did this, this wild thing where they adopted a Cambodian family during the Khmer Rouge genocide. Mm -hmm. I was maybe like, you know, five years old or four years old or something. And we had this Cambodian family that came and lived with us mm -hmm. for like, you know, two years, basically. Wow. They spoke no English. They had like escaped the, the genocide and they had this family makeup that was the same as, as our family, a little nuclear family, like a, a son, my age and a daughter, my sister's age. Um, and so I watched my parents like take care of these total strangers, uh, early on in my life. Um, uh, this story goes on to become extraordinary, but I think what that did is it really like inculcated me into this culture of service and like living a life of serving others. Uh, and I think that was really seminal. And then I think that coupled um, with my grandfather, uh, a lot of my grandfather's family was um, was killed in the Holocaust, right? So I have this sort of like early on strong tradition of, uh, of thinking about how to be of service to others, but also this idea that you don't want to be the good man who does nothing. It spurned me into action at a, at a very young age. Um, so I think those, those kind of two things really formed who I am. My Cambodian family, pretty extraordinary. They ended up opening a bunch of donut shops in Southern California. Now my Cambodian dad's like the Don Corleone wow. of the donut industry in <laughs> Southern California. Yeah. Amazing. But be before all my combat deployments, he used to be a, a monk before the war in Cambodia. He would actually 
um, he would bless me with like these chants and these rituals that helped protect me and ward off bullets when I'd go overseas into combat. That's amazing. How so? They stayed as a as a part of your as your family for forever, forever, forever. I mean, from from their perspective, you know, they we literally. You're from where? San, San Diego originally. I'm actually from Northern California. Okay. From Santa Cruz, which is a sleepy little surfer town. Okay. Uh, about a hundred miles south of San Francisco. And uh, yeah, so they lived with us for a couple of years and then they head on down to San Bernardino to, to start their, you know, classic immigrant story, one donut shop. Now yeah. they have like 13 donut shops and uh, they dominate the donut. Wasn't that industry. where McDonald's started too? It's San Bernardino. Was it? Yeah. Yes. That's yes. where they are in San yes. Bernardino. Exactly. Yeah. That's yeah. where they started. It's I cool. didn't know that. Um, and I guess, so like you fast forward, why, why Navy? Why SEAL? Because you went into that directly from college. So that was a conscious choice. I mean, there's all these different places where you could have served. There's all these different um, branches of the military. So what was that the, why was that the one? Why the Navy? Yeah. Uh, so I think the, I think the short answer is too much Top Gun as a kid. Mm. That's right? a good damn answer. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, did you see the, the, the latest Top Gun? All right. I am in the latest Top Gun. Are you for real? What? Oh yeah. Yeah, so oh, the, the director of Top Gun <laughs> is, I mean, you, you can't really see me, but like I got myself like a little cameo in there. Uh, you know, look, I joined the Navy because that movie, I originally wanted to fly. So I started flying when I was young, just, you know, little airplanes, Cessna 152s and 172s. My mm -hmm. dad got me flying lessons. Um, so I've always been a private pilot. I went to the Naval Academy having watched Top Gun and thinking I would fly. Um, and so anyways, fast forward, I go through my whole Naval career and everything. And then Top Gun 2 yeah. is getting made. And I sort of, I'm living in LA at the time. I catch wind of it. And uh, the this is like the most mafia move I've ever pulled in my whole life. Like <laughs> the director is a guy named Joe Kaczynski and a uh, great guy or whatever. And I had helped him out with, with some stuff, like some consulting about military stuff in the past. And I, and, and I had done it all, you know, sort of gratis on Goodwill. And so I called up Joe and I like, you know, I was like, Joe, you remember that thing I did for you? Yeah. Now you're going to do a thing for me. You and I was like, favorite. you put me in this movie, right? And I did. I got to be in like this bar scene. Oh. Um, yeah. That's and, so but but which one? The first one or the second one? The second one in the hard deck. If you're, the bar is called the hard deck. They actually yes. built the bar on the beach in San Diego. And if you remember this scene where like, Tom Cruise like strolls through the bar in his whites and there's all these people partying, yeah. you know, drinking in the bar yeah. or whatever. And I'm sort of sitting at the bar in between them. You can't really see it because it's kind of blurry, but like I'm but wearing there. I'm wearing a flight jacket and a flight suit. And the best part was credit to the producers of the movie. They actually used real Navy people because it was on the base. So they invited the squadrons to oh, come. Nice. Yeah. And so I knew a lot of those guys because I had served with them and you know, gone to school with them. And at one point, the director called me up and he's like, gosh, gosh, come, come sit here, right, right in the front here. And all the pilots, the real pilots, not like the fake pilot wearing, you know, the costume, uh, all the real pilots are like, gosh, what, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> this is our movie. Oh you guys God, have so, so many funny. movies. Yeah, yeah, you do. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Tell them which one, which one, you yeah. name one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, uh, I went originally to fly, went to the Naval Academy. When I went, I had never even heard of SEALs. You know, at that time, you know, everybody talked about Chuck Norris and Delta Force. Delta Force was a thing. That's that was right. a He made thing. it popular in the 80s, right? That's right. Yeah. That's right. And like, uh, but I went and I was, I was playing water polo at the time. I played D1 water polo and uh you know all these guys from my team were talking about this other community of seals and the more i learned about it the more i said this is yeah. this is who i am and this is where i belong interesting you know um it's it's funny you said about uh, going in from being a pilot from being a seal for example to being a pilot or so on so when you go to military in, in israel there was a story that one particular uh pilot was uh was already i think uh a captain and he was saying that before he was going to be a pilot he was already in Sayyid Matkal which is kind of like the Delta for sure right and when it's like where all your prime ministers come at it, exactly. right? Zach, BB, and all these. Why did they tell you? Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna get to that. Way. We're gonna okay. talk to okay. that. We're gonna talk about that. Okay. But he was saying that he wanted to be a pilot, and he, when you do that, you have to go through boot camp all over again. And some of your instructors can be female instructors that are 19 years old now. He's already 27 years old or so on. He, he has, he's an officer, but they don't know his past. So he was doing a regular basic training and they teach you how to crawl. Now he's there crawling with 18 year olds. And one of the instructor tells him, one of the female instructor tells him, you're not scrolling right. 
So he looked at her and he said, it worked in Libya. Yeah. That was, it's like a classic thing that, yeah, it's just yeah. one of those things. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 It seemed to be fine. I mean, that is, that is always a dynamic, right? Yeah. Like we actually had a, we had a SEAL go through training with me who had done like eight platoons back to back in oh. South America. He'd actually saved the lives of some of our instructors. Really? Yeah. Wild guy. He's just, Did he finish? Level. oh yeah, 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 yeah. He, um, yeah, he's he's a hardcore guy. Yeah. Yeah. So in this in, in the in the Navy SEAL, you obviously have teams, right? And I feel like this is a, the question I ask myself right away when um, after they they got uh, uh, Osama yeah. bin Laden, yeah. uh, Barack Obama went and he announced it was Team Six. And the first thing I said, why would you actually announce anything? Like just say it's us and that's it at most. Like why would you say it's Navy SEAL? Why would you say it's Team Six? That's not kind of like. And then I noticed that the actual operators that killed him went out in public and said that was me. And it's just so ag against everything I'm coming from. It's like, why would anyone say anything? Just keep it quiet. Yes, yeah. it's us. We don't need to know who, what, nothing. Yeah. Extra I, information, unneeded information. What, do you think it was necessary? I, I think what you're saying is kind of was the prevailing attitude in my community. Mm -hmm. People like a lot for us, we lived in the shadows for so long. Like people didn't know what we did or who we were. You know, I mean, even through most of my like combat deployments and stuff, like we didn't take photos, right? Like, you know, even, you know, if we're out at bars in San Diego, you know, when we were, you know, training back home or whatever, we all had you know, fake professions that we'd tell girls, right? Yeah, like yeah. Th we really embodied this. I'm a plumber. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, I said I was the guy um, that would drive this machine that changed the lanes on the Coronado Bridge from like three lanes in the morning to two lanes. <laughs> it was like just weird enough that nobody yeah. pursued it or asked nobody anybody. Wants to imagine she said, oh, yeah. it's exactly what I do for a living. Yeah. Tell me more. What yeah. do you do? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was great. And uh, so I, th I think there used to be this ethos of being the quiet professional, and that was really important to our community. Um, my personal opinion, though, is that there was an inflection point because of bin Laden. And the idea that the American public would not want to know or even didn't deserve to know some, not all of the operational details about arguably the most important mission since World War II was basically untenable. They were going to find out somehow, some way. And uh, I, I, I work with our community, with the command a lot on this idea that, listen, either you, and I think this is true, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're an individual, whatever, if you don't tell your story, somebody else will tell it for you. And mm, I think control for, the narrative. you yes. have to. Yeah. So I've been uh, not critical, but uh, I, I've done some like analytical thinking on this for the command. And I think that was a watershed moment for the SEAL community because no longer could we exist in the shadows without yeah. was that Was that when the the concept of a navy seal was more popular totally that was that was it totally that, that was the moment so that was there was never there was no turning back i know you moment. i know uh, uh jocko was your jujitsu trainer right yeah he was i just saw okay. jocko at army navy on, on really? thursday yeah, yeah so yeah. jocko has built a huge personal brand extreme ownership the book and then uh, there's like a, a million other now um personalities that have come out so was that a after is, that is okay. that's post you okay. know and look i think in the ag some people in our community really uh, like despise what's happened, that we are now so much in the spotlight and so much public facing. Um, but like I said, my personal opinion is that was inevitable mm -hmm. after that moment. And I think there is a lot of value and wisdom that you can take from the kind of training that we did from like special operations community, special operations philosophy, then you can apply that wisdom in the civilian world. So I think things like what Jocko is doing is actually really great. Like another example is you guys might know uh, my friend, David Goggins. Yes. Right? yes. Okay. Yeah. So look, you know, Goggins, there is, there is some kid who gets up in like a shitty urban area, like gang infested area of the country every day who might like go down a stray path if it were not for Goggin's book, but mm -hmm. because he read Goggin's book, right, about mental toughness, about fortitude, he gets up and goes for a run instead of getting up and- But like, when you when you around. go and you actually announce, okay, this is team six, I don't think it was broken down like this, go, my opinion. Go get, go get liquor, go get liquor. You're not, let's, you're forget <laughs> let's, let's talk to, wait a minute. Do you want, let, me, let me finish I, my question. No, <laughs> we're gonna get to that. I didn't interrupt you with your question. But you're gonna go for a- We're gonna get to that. Minutes. So wait a minute, no. 
Uh, so if you go and you ask, okay, why would someone announce? And I think if I was to be behind the scenes and say, okay, why would I want to announce the Team Six or the Navy SEAL? Probably there's something about the fact that if you do so, you, yeah, you want them to be under the radar, but you also want to have input of more people coming in so you can screen more people and you can better the, the SEALs, right? And if you don't talk about this, it's like you've never done this. And it's like, okay, you can do the best operations, but you want the people to idolize your soldiers, especially the special forces. So more of them would inspire to be there. And if you don't talk about this, it's a risk because then you can compromise them and they can go after their families and it's bad, but you know, that's what they're doing every day. So maybe, and I'm thinking that's probably the, the other coin, right? Mm -hmm. I think you're right. I think you're right. And look, I, you have exposed a rift within the community. You know, I happen to be on one side of the line, which is that, Hey, we're better off controlling the narrative and let, and then letting somebody else tell our story. Um, but there is, I think it's almost like 50, 50. Do you feel it made a difference though for you guys? After like more people came in, you have better personnel, but more to select to kind of like elevate the quality. You know, I, I think it's hard to say. I think there's a lot of downsides of mm -hmm. being in the public eye. Like nowadays, you know, young guys who are aspirational SEALs, they'll DM me on Instagram or text me or find my contact somehow. And they're going in and they're asking me these like crazy questions about special mission units and like, yeah. oh, and should I go to an SDV team? I was like, Listen, buddy, like make it through day one, week one of buds before you start thinking about that. They're going through with all of this knowledge that they've like gleaned from books, you know, and their motivations are are different, right? Um, you know, they are uh, in some ways they're going because, you know, seals are cool or special forces are cool and they've read about them in books and stuff. And I think it's a different characterization of motivation. Yeah. Yeah, um, so that part I would call it a downside, but then again, like my, you know, in but contrast, going to have for every one person, there's going to be 10 that are not supposed to make it. And you you still have to go through a lot of copper for one ounce of gold, right? That's exactly what I would say. I mean, look, the instructors are really good about protecting the integrity of our community. And when you look at the graduation rates and stuff, it's still about a 90% failure rate. So mm -hmm. despite like all of the changes mm -hmm. or whatever, no matter how big they open the funnel up at top, you still get the same number of hard dudes through the through at the bottom and that seems to be pretty consistent you know over time that's yeah. awesome by the way i'm gonna give you some alcohol because scott is a canadian and he likes liquor no 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 we're just, we're just <laughs> 30 have, minutes this in. is 30 <laughs> minutes in you're right okay so we have options I'm starving no, yeah. we, we have yeah. it's, it's a brand new one they call it jack daniels i don't know if you ever heard of it the, this is one we have this tequila actually that i got from my neighbors as a gift because i allowed them to park their boat in my spot yeah. And which one do you want? This one or this one? Well, my dad would pick whiskey. He's a Marine, you know, Paris Island uh -huh. Marine or whatever. But I, I think I'll I'll join in tequila. Let's yeah. do tequila then. Oh, I'll move that off just so it doesn't in, in keeping with the, the Latin theme of, of Southern Bring Florida here. Yeah, right, let's do the... Um, uh, you guys, this is fantastic. I had no idea. Like, you know, <laughs> Listen, we have fun. To, we're this work fun gets good. Yeah. You, have to, you have to get a place up in Fort Lauderdale. So I mean, this, this is a good we hard sell right weekend. here. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, we got a lot, a lot of questions. Yeah. You know, when you said it's, it's a good man, I'm going to pick on the word man. You didn't use pronouns, by the way, and you're from California. So, <laughs> oh, did I not announce my, my pronouns before the podcast? No, what, you did what, not. What oh, kind of a person very, are you? Very okay. easy. <laughs> my, my pronouns are commander and sir. Ah, you know, I, I love it. Expect I to be addressed it. appropriately. I love yeah. it. Good. So, so actually, I, I spoke one time, I spoke to Jeff, who, um, also SEAL member, and ask him women, because we saw also G.I. Joe, right? Uh, G.I. Jane, yeah. G.I. Jane, right? With uh, Demi Moore. It's our favorite and, movie in the community. Yeah. Really? <laughs> no, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't I don't know, but... Um, it's not enough to kill it. So he told me, yeah, women to cannot get. make it through... Uh, th he told me both uh, on the head, they can't. Th that's what all women that try fail. Is that true? Like, why can we, can't women make it into Navy SEALs? Well, uh, well, right now they can't because it's prohibited. It's like one of the last communities. It's in, prohibited straight up. Straight. There are no women in the SEAL teams. But they cannot Never try. Never have they, they can't try. I, I think that is probably on the precipice of changing. 
um, just as the rest of, because every other domain of the military has been integrated. So you had uh, women who went through uh, ranger selection school. Um, I don't know if a woman's gone through the Q course yet, which is this the Army Special Forces Selection ODA. There's no women in uh, the, the Air Force, Force Pararescue or the Air Force Special Operations community. Um, look, but eventually I think all of these components will be integrated. I think that is inevitable. It seems to be the trend line. We will just probably be last because of like how tight the community yeah. is. And look, I I love Jeff. He's one of my best friends. Uh, but I, I do think that there are women who can make it through. They have the um, you know, like I'll show you some some women who competed at the CrossFit Games who will outperform a lot of men. Um, but I do think, but I also at the same time think that there's something about unit cohesion, right? Mm -hmm. And there's something about like having women in the unit can change the internal dynamics. So that's that's something that has to be dealt with and mitigated. Like you're the, in the SEAL teams, you are extraordinarily close knit and personality. Conflicts and differences can be really, really mm -hmm. deadly. N not differences. Personality conflicts can be extremely deadly. Um, you know, for example, when you go in the kill house, right, you're operating on these incredibly thin margins. In the of kill the, house? Yeah, for like CQC. For Do you close know what's quarters a kill house, combat. by the way? Because, no, oh, yeah, we're not. We, we don't kill know. house. So, like, imagine in close quarters combat, you're entering a house like mm -hmm. they did in the Bin Laden raid and you you go through a door right and you're shooting targets yeah. as you as you go through the door right it's so oh, that's a kill house that's the kill okay. house so it's the training environment for okay. that and we do live fire kill houses because we try and approximate in yeah. training as close to combat as possible sure. right yeah. so even like the weight of the gun and the ammunition yeah. and the recoil right you could shoot some munition you could shoot all these other you stuff you have to do live it's not you have to do live right you have to do live right so Look, it's so competitive sometimes that you go in the house. If you don't take that shot right away, somebody is shooting over your shoulder, right? Yeah. To take the shot. And you have to be able to understand like the movements of your your fellow platoon mates, you know, in the dark, at night. Under what do you arrest. think it would be any different if a woman is joining you guys in this one? I, I don't think ultimately it will be any different, but I think in the beginning, in the early integration, there's going to mm -hmm. be some growing pains associated with that, you know? So well, cheers, guys. Cheers. Oh, wait, I missed it. That was the water. We got to redo it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I grabbed the wrong. Oh. All, all this crystal looks the same. Oh, my to me. God. All right. All right. <laughs> oh, wow. Did you finish? Yeah. I mean, I took a shot. That's, that's oh, I wasn't I do. doing a shot. I was just taking a sip. Okay. I'll do a sip now then. All right. That's so <laughs> funny. Because <laughs> last time I was trying to prank them, I was yeah. not prank them. I was trying to actually, because I didn't want to drink. I was putting water. Yeah. Act like I was uh, like this, but they, they got me. So. You know, we All call right. this karma. Then. Cheers. Yeah, that is karma. Cheers. 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 <laughs> mm -hmm. Delicious. Thank you for having Thanks. me. I love that. Um, so the story that I want you to tell, which I think is really interesting, is that when you were in training, you were in the water, and this is, we're just now sort of speaking about Osama. You were in the water when 9-11 happened. Yep. So walk me through, um, I, I walk me through your training, but that that moment, because I'm pretty sure that was a pretty uh, big moment for anybody in the seminal moment yeah. changed changed not just the nature of our community, but the the direction of the country. Right. Yeah. So I was in Bud's first phase of and what's Buds. Buds? Buds is basic underwater demolition seal training. How can you not know those stuff? Yeah, <laughs> I gave you a list of terms. Then. Yeah, <laughs> look at your acronym cheat sheet. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so seal training is called Buds Basic Underwater Demolition Seal Training. It's the um, every seal who has ever existed has gone through Buds. Uh, in fact, there's this. This is a funny side note, but there's this like rash epidemic of fake seals now that we're so public. We're talking about stolen valor. I'm so curious about huge that. stolen valor. There's an old crusty frogman. Stolen what? Stolen valor is somebody who purports to have been a CEO or okay. have combat medals or yeah. something when they didn't really have it. Right? Happens all the time. All the time. Every country has it. And yeah. like, yeah. And the number of times I meet a guy in a bar who like tell me he's a seal, and then I'll like ask him a few like critical questions, and you know, and then I'll either like you know yeah. threaten to snatch the life out of him, yeah. you know, or have him recant. You know, yeah. it happens all the time, right? Um, so. Uh, every SEAL who has ever existed went through BUDS. It takes place in Coronado, California. BUDS is about seven months long, and it's divided into three phases. First phase, physical conditioning, of which the most famous evolution is Hell Week. 
mm-hmm. which is five days of no sleep and, and, and intense extreme physical exertion. Uh, second phase is dive phase where you learn to dive the rebreathers for combat diving. And then third phase is land warfare where you start to really kind of layer in some, some actual combat skills. And what most people don't realize is when you graduate buds, you then have another, you know, several months of what we call advanced warfare qualification training plus jump school, plus military free fall school. It is- So, so Hell, Hell Week is not the last? Hell Week month. is in the very beginning. Oh. Sometimes it's the fourth week of training. Sometimes it's the fifth, sometimes even the third week of training. Oh. But no, because look, the truth is most of those people are going to quit anyways. Oh. So wash them out early. Why training them all those That's events? Right. Yes. That's yeah. right. So Hell Week is like the third or fourth week of training. Gets right away. You like cut the fat and get them going. So my class, in buds started with, a, I think 246 people plus or minus like one or two. Um, and we graduated 26 originals. So our attrition rate was about 92%. Mm-hmm. That's pretty typical. Per the year? Vast, Is that per year? So there's four to five classes a year okay. that go through. Um, so you can imagine we produce about a hundred new seals a year. Um, and we've tried to increase that in a bunch of ways because um, seals were in high demand over the last two decades. Uh, but it's, it's a hard thing to do. A um, hundred a year. Yeah. And wow. we have the same tenant, you know, in special operations that they, they do in Israeli special forces, which is you can't mass produce special forces, yeah. right? By, by definition, by nature, right? If you try and scale it too much, they the will quality, lose their specialness. Yeah. 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 And so there's always this tension between quantity and quality. So um, in, on September 11th of 2001, I was in first phase of training we every once a week you do these timed evolutions well you do a timed evolution every day but once a week one of the timed evolutions is a two mile ocean swim you have to make a certain cutoff time uh in order to progress uh my swim buddy and i had just come in we were changing out getting ready to run over to the chow hall um after finishing the two mile ocean swim and we started to hear like people chattering like oh an airplane hit the World Trade Center, the Twin Towers and stuff. And we kind of didn't really think anything of it. Uh, We kind of thought it was like maybe like a ruse because the instructors are always playing these fuck fuck games with you. And we're like, ah, whatever. And so then we run over as a class, you run over a mile to the to the chow hall to get breakfast. The swim starts at like 5 a.m. and you're out by 7 a.m. and then you're headed over to breakfast. And so you're running, you're marching as a class running over to the chow hall. And then we got to the chow hall and we saw- That's after Hell Week? This is pre-Hell Week Mm -hmm. for us. We're still pre-Hell Week. So we still have a big raging horde of a class. And we looked in on the TVs and we could see the planes going into the tower because you know 7 a.m west coast time 10 a.m it already happened on the east coast and we're like well these instructors are knuckle draggers they're not sophisticated enough to put this ruse up this must be real and to their credit the instructors pulled us over post class and they said like two planes just hit the world trade center we're going to war and we're just going to beat you guys until enough people quit and we find out who doesn't want to be here. So they spent the rest of the day just beating us down. I think we had like 25 guys. They knew quit. something was happening. They, they knew. Yeah. Like I had sort of like, it, so you know, you're a like they, student. You felt like they smart. wanted to speed up the process in case the deployment would be sooner and it's time to get rid of the weed. I don't think it was that literal. I think it was more emotional. They intuitively, instinctively, because the thing about the BUDS instructors is they're just rotating out of the SEAL team that's not their permanent job. Yeah. They rotate out. They're active almost, duty. They're full active duty okay. guys. And quite often you end up serving with them back in the SEAL platoons. It's mm-hmm. a rotation, like a post-deployment rotation that these guys do to take a little bit of a break and yeah. to train the next generation of frogmen, a charter they take very seriously. Um, so they knew that they would very soon likely be going back to war. They could just, they could just feel it. Um, and they were right. And we spent the next two decades uh, as a community, um, really sharpening the knife and becoming one of the more lethal military units on the planet. And and can you talk about like the the missions that you took on when you sure. were active duty? Sure, sure, sure. So, so you go through. So just to, so so you you fast forward the timeline a little bit. So you, I wouldn't even ask that question. Well, but you were so comfortable asking and you're so uncomfortable answering. I was thinking it's kind of like a taboo. But I'm glad. Yeah. No, no, no. no, no, no. Super. Actually, I do want to understand your Hell Week experience. I think that's sort of uh, what 
people know of SEALs training. So yeah. let's let's talk about that first. Sure. And then we can go into your active duty. Yeah. So how was that? What okay, so what let's let's describe it. What is it? So Hell Week is what they call the hardest week of the hardest military training on the planet. And it's essentially you start on a Sunday night-ish um, and then you continue to go for the next five days. I think in total you get about two to three hours of sleep over the course of the week of training and it's all physical evolutions. So that first night of Hell Week, we ran, you know, 25 miles, most of that with boats and logs. I'd never run 25 miles before. I'd never done a marathon or anything and much less carrying all this shit on you. Um, and you do that all through the night. You're wet and sandy basically the entire time. And uh, it's where the vast majority of people quit. And one of the things that really, really gets people to quit, they say ring the bell because they carry this actual bell around with you throughout the entire week of training. Well, through the whole class of training, but specifically in hell week, it's right there. So guys can just go to the bell and ring out and quit. And uh, yeah, most of those guys, well, here's kind of an interesting thing. Most of the people that quit in my class, and I've corroborated this through other classes, did not quit on that first night when we did all that work. Mm -hmm. They start off hell week with all these, you know, bombs going off and like machine guns firing. And there's a, this adrenaline that kind of carries you through that first night. Mm -hmm. And then in the morning, while you're still running and doing all the stuff, the sun comes up and people can kind of get through that first day. But then what happens is that second night, right? They, they sit you out on the berm in, in Coronado, uh, and they wait and they do a shift change. And so you're sitting there and they instructors get on the megaphone or alpha, alpha shift is coming. It's going to be a long, cold night. And now you've been wet for like 24 hours and, you know, people are shivering and it's going to be a long night. We're going to beat you down all night. And, you know, guys, like they just start running for the bell. Like you see the guy next to you, he just takes off and you hear it like ding, ding, wow, ding. And it's funny, it, for me, it was like an extraordinary lesson because if you had told me prior to becoming a Navy SEAL that the hardest part of SEAL training would be sitting on the beach in Coronado watching the sunset, I would have been like, you're crazy, right? And was that really all those years in the SEAL? being a SEAL, was that really the hardest? Well, that was the hardest part of training. Oh. Being an actual SEAL, being in combat is a hundred X harder. I was colder. I was more scared. I was more tired huh. overseas than I ever was in training. Um, but as far as training goes, Hell Week is, is the hardest moment, but it's also the best moment. And what I learned from watching those guys sit on the, on the berm there and, and quit is that it's often not the act itself that causes people to fail. It's the fear of the act, right? Because mm. for the most part, those of us who like, if you just say like, nope, I'm not going to succumb to those fears and you just start something, you quite often finish it. But that's where they were mentally weak and that's where they broke down. And, and BUDS is essentially designed to find out who's going to quit when things get hard, when you're cold, you're wet, you're tired, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, if you quit in that, you know, sitting on the beach in Coronado at wow. sunset, what are you going to do in combat? Yeah. And, and is there, cause you had 246, you said plus minus. Yeah. So do people not try and support each other and keep each other from quitting? Is there any of that camaraderie built or is it too soon for that? There, there is, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. This is another, you know, now we're talking about like not the broad strokes, but these like little micro mm -hmm. like learning impressions mm -hmm. that I kind of picked up. I noticed that a lot of guys quit in twos, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a crazy thing, but it'd be like this guy, they're, you're cold, you're in the ocean, you're shivering, yeah. right? It's, it's night or, you know, you're under the boat and it's tired or you have the big log and, and everything. And some guy will whis whisper, to his buddy, he'd be like, dude, I'm, I'm done, man. Oh, like, wow. I'm like, Let, let's go. I'll go if you go kind of thing. And they're like, yeah, let's go. Let's get out of here, man. And so they like, mm. and so they, they go and they ring the bell together. Right. And that taught me that fear is contagious. 
right? People who are scared, yeah. like if you have solidarity and like... So that's why it's important to kill those people away from you, to push them away from you. That's right. If you have negativity around you, anything who negative, you surround don't, yourself yeah, with. do yeah. not be near me. All those quotes it, are... Re- it, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? The flip side of that coin is also that courage is contagious. Mm. So if you surround yourself with courageous people mm. who are doing great things, yeah. quite often... It will lead you on an How much of this path. do you see in real life business-wise? I mean, there's just so much to say about that in real life when you actually open a company and you see negativity. Just one person say, guys, it's not going to work. Just get out of the room. I don't want to hear you. Just yeah. don't, don't be contagious. 100%. Yeah. All of the success that I have had in life is due to these formative experiences I had both in training and then as an operational SEAL. Like They made me who I am. I can't extrapolate out now, like how I think about running a company from those experiences that I had. I'm, I'm just like Popeye. I, I am what I am. You know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's fascinating. Go, go yeah. So I was going to say, um, so that, so that's really the summation of, of hell week. It's a lot of, it's, it's psychologically basically weighing on you of physical conditions. People are quitting in pairs because there's a psychological aspect. So now you get, say you get through hell week. Uh, after you get through Hell Week, you still have more training. You have that. You have event. six more months of buds. Yeah. So you have- <laughs> yeah. you're still a, a goddamn bud student for six months. Your life is miserable. For how many? How many quit percentage wise on Hell Week compared to the rest? You know, I, it, is it mostly proficiency after that when people are getting kicked out of? It's more. On, yeah. 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 People usually, if you've made it through Hell Week, you are tough enough not to quit. Um, then there's different things that knock people out of training. In second phase, there's a thing called pool competency where the instructors basically take you underwater and they like shark you beat you up underwater tie your regulators and hoses and knots and stuff and you have to unfuck yourself right and demonstrate that you are comfortable in any calm enough to think through that problem to think through the problem set 100 yeah. a lot of guys fail out because of that some guys fail out because of dive physics they're real tough but they don't have the cognitive horsepower to get through some of the thinking part of the job and so that's all second phase third phase uh primarily the thing that knocks people out are safety violations mm. right so if you wow. don't have the situational awareness when we're like shooting, moving and communicating, if you sweep your buddy, right? Or if you do something stupid with demolition, right? We just say like, okay, you don't have the technical competence, right? Or the situational awareness to be safe doing these extraordinarily dangerous things we do, you know? Uh, halo jumps, hey ho jumps yeah. at night on an unmarked DZ, right? These What's are- What's a DZ? A uh, drop zone. Right. So like one of the things we do for as an insertion technique are these very advanced free fall parachuting Mm -hmm. insertions Um, to do that at night on night vision. Right. In unknown conditions requires extreme competence. And if you can't do kind of the basics during training, we deem you unsafe. Um, And it's pretty easy to recognize that stuff in aggregate. What buds the training pipeline does is it exposes all of your weaknesses in first phase. If you're not mentally tough and if you're not physically tough, that'll be exposed. In second phase, if you can't coolly and calmly think through a problem set, right, it exposes that. In third phase, um, if you're not situationally aware of both sort of safety while accomplishing a mission, it exposes that. You know what I find fascinating? This whole training regime, you came out of college and you went into this first tranche and then uh, six months after there's no training it's just like life learned experiences have hopefully prepped you for the exact amount of like psychological physical plus um, cognitive requirements that you need to make it through this training there's no practice i lean towards what you were saying that this is an eight right so one of my i know we've talked about buds a lot but uh One of my favorite things is like pre hell week, right before hell week starts, uh, everybody's scared. Like there's no reason not to be scared. You know, most of the people with you are not going to make it through. You don't know what to expect. And we had this instructor get up and, and this speaks to your question about this sort of innate like Mm -hmm. ability to do it. Uh, he gets up, he's like, look, I know you guys are all scared. We're in the classroom, right? I know you guys are all scared, but if you want to know what hell week is, it's really simple. Happy to tell you what it is. You all are a bunch of Grecian urns, right? You know, like the things, you know, like your Grecian urns. And inside some of your urns is like cotton candy. Inside some of your urns is sand. Inside a few of your urns is actually steel. But inside a very, very few amount of your urns is 
Damascus steel, which is the hardest steel known to man because of the way it's layered and forged. And he said, if you want to know what Hell Week is, it's real simple. All we're going to do is smash your urns and find out what's inside. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of, I lean towards what you're intimating is that in some ways, like people, I don't know if you're born into it, but you're a product of your experiences to that point. Mm -hmm. And and some people are either ready or they're not. If you have to go again for through Hell Week, just drop you with those people. Uh, how are you going to feel before you enter this? It's going to be like, yeah, no big deal. Or are you going to be like, uh, yeah, all right. Yeah, bring it. I think the, the first yeah. time's the worst. Like, <laughs> the first time I, the worst. I think I'm over the age uh, waiver now, you know? <laughs> but I would still like bring it. Yeah, exactly. yeah. that's nice. Um, so, okay. So after training, uh, let's talk about active active service. So what where where did you go? What did you what did you take on? How does that actually work for a SEAL team? What is, what are a SEAL team tasked with versus any other specialist branch of the military? Yeah. So after after my training, I went to advanced warfare training after I graduated BUDS. I was an officer. Uh, two of the four officers in my class um, were assigned to SEAL Team 1, which was the first SEAL team uh, commissioned by President Kennedy in 1962. Um, so I went to this this storied SEAL team um, and I SEAL did- Team 1. SEAL Team 1. Okay. Yeah. We called it No Fun 1 because they were <laughs> like real serious. The culture of each SEAL okay. team is different, even though we all essentially- What is the, the difference things. between all SEAL teams? There's no real difference. Prior to 9-11, we were organized geographically. That all went out the window after 9-11 and we all do the same stuff. And what's different about SEALs in comparison to other special operations forces is that SEALs are generous. Every SEAL shoots, every SEAL dives, every sh- SEAL jumps, all right? In a in the Army Special Forces, the Green Berets, in, in an ODA, they have a specific- well, What's an ODA? It's an Operational Detachment Alpha. So we're organized into platoons. They're organized into ODAs or their little unit okay. and group. In a, in a Special Forces Green Beret ODA, they have like an ODA dive team. And all those guys do is dive. They're like specialists in that art. Um, whereas SEAL platoons, uh, we're, we're much more general in terms of, of what we do. And as officers, we're even sort of more generalist because the idea is we have to be able to lead a SEAL platoon of snipers and medics and demo guys and breachers and, and all mm-hmm. of this stuff. So I showed up as a young junior officer to SEAL Team 1, uh, was assigned to my first platoon. And I did my first deployment actually to the Pacific region, to the PACOM region. So even though at the time there was a lot of focus um, on Afghanistan, Iraq hadn't kicked off yet, but there was a lot of focus on, oh no, Iraq had kicked off on Iraq, Afghanistan. We forget that in the special operations community, you know, we're probably currently deployed to 76 countries around the world. There was all these small, low intensity conflicts that were happening around the world and those still all have to be serviced. Um, so I spent a good portion of that deployment in the Southern Philippines. Um, and we were doing counterterrorism work against primarily two terrorist groups. One was called ASG, Abu Sayyaf group. Yeah, and then, Sayyaf, yeah. yeah. And then my favorite South over there. Yes. In, in the, we were in Mindanao. Yes. So there's an autonomous breakaway region of Muslim Mindanao. Yeah. Um, and, and we were helping the Filipino special forces, uh, pro- prosecute and conduct missions against high value targets in, in this low intensity conflict that didn't get a lot of attention, but was just as real as anything else. And they, uh, the second terrorist group was actually my favorite terrorist group. It was the Moro Islamic Liberation Front, known as the MILF. So, oh, yeah. Wow. So it was. Now like, you get to fight MILFs now. Wow. Yeah, I mean, right. listen, it's a hard job, but somebody's got to do it. Right. You know, <laughs> like yeah. So what, what, where was that? What uh, what country was it? It was all Philippines. And oh, also, also, okay. So that was all Southern Philippines and then Indonesia. And there was these terrorist rap Were they in conflict with Abu Sayyaf or were they... They were. They were. So and they're also fighting with each other. Th- no. Uh, the a- ASG and, and and the MILF like were kind of two separate organizations, but they had the same sort of aims and stuff. ASG was a more nefarious organization because they were aligned with a group called J.I. Jama Islamaya, which was probably most famous for doing those Bali bombings Mm -hmm. in Indonesia. Um, So there was this, all of these networks where they were supplying training arms and people, we called it the coconut triangle between Indonesia and the Southern Philippines and, and, and a couple different other areas. And so we were, and that was a really 
that was a really interesting problem set because it was um, it wasn't like Iraq and Afghanistan where we had like robust infrastructure. You had a vast number of islands, like the tyranny of geography, and we had to find these guys. Like I remember we were hunting this guy. I think his name was John Jelani or or something, kind of one of the leaders of the terrorist organization. And he had, you know, one arm and rode a horse and we couldn't find him. And we're, and, you know, we'd like constantly beat up the intel weenies like, yeah, you guys can't find this dude with one arm and a horse so we can go get him. <laughs> like, come on. Yeah. And how does the, how does the U.S. decide? Because there's all these micro conflicts around the world that are not the headline conflicts. So yeah. a SEAL team is a is a valuable resource. So how does the U.S. government decide where to place you? How how did we decide that in the Philippines that was worthy of a SEAL resource versus anywhere else? Well, certainly then and probably definitely still true today, like the decision making is above my pay grade. Right. But it's <laughs> it, I mean, look, it's it's geopolitical, but it's also internal. So there's a competition for resources. Just if you think of DOD or Special Operations Command as a giant corporation for a second, there's always going to be internal competition for resources. And there's going to be, you know, an admiral who's head of the PACOM theater who, you know, thinks that this is important to prosecute. What I would say, so there's like the internal piece, but then there's the sort of external geopolitical piece. And what I would say is that at that time, the US government had created policy and had believed in a policy that said Muslim extremism around the world needs to be tamped down, right? And we will assist countries in their fight against Islamic extremism. Now, we didn't use that word and even that term became like politically charged, right? But that was the basic idea, right? Is we saw Islamic extremism festering Mm -hmm. around the world Mm -hmm. and it was pretty easy for ambassadors of countries and like the powers that be to decide that we would go take on those kind of conflicts. No, that makes sense. And then throughout the rest of my career, I would end up I would end up following that narrative and path, right? So deployed to the Middle East, obviously, to do a bunch of stuff there. And then I I finished my career. I stood up the the SEAL component, the Naval Special Warfare component of Special Operations Command Africa. So in some ways, my career came full circle because what I had been doing in the beginning of my career, I ended up doing the same thing on the African continent, um, largely... Uh, working against like extreme Islamic militant organizations. Abu Karam and all those. For sure. I spent a lot of time in Northern Nigeria um, looking for some Boko Haram guys. Yeah. Um, So I'm curious because you post, post uh, active duty, then you went into media, but I was watching a few other podcasts you were on. So the New York times wrote a hit piece on, on seals. Oh yeah. So was that the impetus for you wanting to work in media or what was, what can you walk through what yeah. that was about? That's a word. Yeah. Oh yeah. Bring it. Yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> in for a penny, in for a pound. Yeah. You know? yeah. Awesome. I, I knew it was dangerous to come yeah. up here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's this, this this heavy Israeli pour that we have. No, that, that was that was, heavy a that was a gift. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's more tequila than water for sure. So if you want, make sure you drink the right one, it's just the more full glass. Yeah. At some point, it's all it's all mm-hmm. going down. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, yeah, we were talking about my transition to media. So yeah. basically, what happened is when I got off. It wasn't related to that article, okay. um, although funny enough, there was another, not another, another the tequila started to hit. There was another article. <laughs> I blame both of you. There was another. There are some secrets. <laughs> 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 That's it, like TSSCI clearance. Yeah, <laughs> going away. Yeah, uh, there's gonna be like a Russian honeypot that comes in. Give you know? <laughs> <laughs> to your tricks. Yeah. Oh, oh my god. Canadian and an Israeli. Yeah. <laughs> we don't tell anything. anything. Oh, we we yeah. can keep a secret over here. Uh, good, good. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> the uh, just this weekend there was another New York Times piece that came out uh, from the same reporter, and he kind of like thinks of himself as like the. Seal whisperer. Was I he guess. in the seal? Was he no. army? Was he anything? No, no, no. He's like uh, so. He read books, I guess. Right? Totally. And okay. we basically spent the weekend kind of making fun of him because the gist of this current article and like bad on the times, right? Like you know, I'm like I, I had a very successful career in media and journalism, like nominated for multiple Emmys. I'm proud of the my body of work, yeah. uh, and I always grew up like respecting the reportage of the New York Times. But like, I read this piece of shit article, both these pieces of shit article on the front page of the Times. And I was like, 
I'm like, come on, you guys, you've lost your way. The, the gist of this article that uh, this guy, Dave Phillips, wrote is that, oh, these poor Navy souls who join up the, the SEAL teams to do this incredible job and be commandos and all this stuff. And now the, and then they don't make it through training. And now their talent is being wasted, you know, chipping paint on a, on a ship. Right. And basically like sympathetic to the buds quitters was yeah. the gist of this article. And like, I, I basically said like, listen, man, you don't fundamentally understand the job one, our community or two, the job that we are tasked with doing. You're asking guys to do superhuman tasks, right? And your concern is with the guys who quit, not with the guys who have to go out and do one of the hardest things on the planet. Is that is that uh, an isolated incident or do you feel that uh, general public perception of the military is degraded? Because that's a pretty one of the rude reason, piece for such a like a yeah. I mean, look, I think this is an extreme example of an outsider looking in and not getting it. Right. So we, we carried around sides all weekend yeah. that said, you know, Dave Phillips would have quit buds, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but don't, don't, um, I feel like, I feel like globally every in a Western world, right. You can do it in Russia. You can do any of that where they can, when media is controlled, where, where as soon as you have a phone and a video is going to leak and people are going to see the kind of like training, uh, harassment that those poor soldiers have to go through, but they don't get the fact that more sweat during training, less blood during fighting. And then yes. uh, if you're going to put those poor, miserable souls that wanted to get in, but you didn't let them in, you, you save them. Actually, you save their life if you, <laughs> if you put and, and others. Right. So they, they don't really realize that. And it's been it's been out there everywhere. Right. I, I've re I read another uh, piece where they criticize some of the training where you shoot live ammunition uh, right next to the soldiers where it emulates the environment and they need to hear that so they can be more, they can do better. Yeah, so you're than the, conditioned. Yeah. You're conditioned better than the enemy, right? And that's, that's the only thing you can do. And I think it was a team Kennedy that wrote against it later on. He was uh, ex uh, green beret and uh, he has a pretty interesting story. And he was, he was talking about what do you, what do you want us to do? We get them to war for, so they can see it for the first time, yeah. something like that. So it's, uh, it's been always like that. It's been, uh, when I, when I was in the army, I remember there was, they said that one of the worst punishments is when you're in a boot camp and I wasn't sealed, but when you go in, there's a part, part where you need to go uh, during boot camp and you have the weekend where you go off. And if you, if you fucked it up, you did something wrong. You have to state what you did. If not, if they know, and you didn't say you're going to lose your vacation time, but they said back then they would go and if let's just say they really get pissed at you, they would, and you would hide and you would think, well, maybe they haven't seen what I did my fuck up. They wouldn't mention that during the fuck up lineup and they would let you get on a bus and you, they would, you would dress with the uniform where you go out with. And then they would go and say, Hey, Johnny, you never mentioned that blah, 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 get off, put your uniform and so on. And then eventually they removed it because some parents complained and so on. And they said, it's in your men and all that. They eventually reversed that. But I remember that uh, they got, we got yelled at, said, because of all of you little wuss, that was in the nineties, you know, in our time, it wasn't like that, but you guys are, and it was, it was, uh, thankfully it was reversed after that. But for little things like that, that makes no sense. What the hell are you letting parents get involved? That's not, uh, you, yeah. you know, what's really inhumane is sending young men to war who aren't prepared for war. Ah, the worst. That's the yeah, real yes, inhumanity yes. because yeah. war is terrible, right? So we owe it to like the parents, to the fathers and mothers, right? To do everything we can to send the right people yeah. and prepare for war. We undertake the most dangerous missions. We have to do the hardest training. And even in training, people can get killed in training. It's unfortunate accidents happen, but without those accidents, more will die in battle. It's just not that those, those accidents are necessary. It just... It's just like when you look at Elon Musk when he launched a rocket, unless he blew up, he didn't push hard enough. We have to push as hard as we can because we have to be better than the enemy. Because if the enemy wins, it, they're going to knock on our border. Does, it, does that happen? Yes. Are people dying in Of training? course, it does. Because yeah. once you yeah. use live ammunition, eventually something is going to happen through millions of rounds. I understand. And, and, and thousands and thousands, of millions of soldiers getting trained, accidents happen. But without that, it's a necessary evil. Yeah. And especially in the SEAL teams, right? Because even sometimes the training is so extraordinarily dangerous that, like you said, accidents happen. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, a, it's a volume equation. Parachutes don't open. Yes. Like, you know, guys turn the wrong way in the kill house. Like, shit happens. And it's because we're training right at that threshold. You're at the yeah, edge. Right. You're, you're always exactly. at the edge. Exactly. So, okay. So, 
besides the the shitty uh, New York Times article, oh, yeah. why did you? So why did you go into media? So that's a real rabbit hole. Yeah. So I went into media because some of the things that I had seen in overseas, I thought the American public had a definitive right to know those things. Right. I also felt that the military perspective wasn't being represented in the media ecosystem and the media environment. Um, you know, there were very few veterans who were telling story, very, very few people who had kind of walked a mile in mm -hmm. the boots of the soldiers and kind of understood the community. You had, frankly, a, a bunch of Dave Phillips, yeah. right? Looking from the outside in, but nobody who really kind of understood the DNA of the military community. And as we were debating really hard national security questions, right? Like, what constitutes torture? Like, should we do a surge or should we withdraw from Iraq, right? I thought it was important for the American public to be as informed as possible to ultimately like help influence those decisions, right? You know, obviously like the hierarchy and the, the politicos make those decisions, but at the end of the day, we're still a democracy and mm -hmm. power flows from the people. So it became, it became like a personal quest of mine to to tell these stories of some of the things that I had seen overseas, shine a light in dark places and, and help people understand. Understood. So, so how did you, okay. So you pivot into media now, um, maybe explain, cause I know that you were doing a whole bunch of war correspondence and reporting. This is actually, uh, where you uh, were monitoring Boko Haram. That yep. was also, and you were working yeah. with Vice. And yeah. So, okay. So walk through. It maybe. was really weird. And yeah. I was still serving in the reserves. So I was off active duty, yeah. but I was still serving in the reserves. And I had to keep this funny church and state separation yeah. between, you know, what I was doing for CNN or, you know, yeah. Vice on HBO and what I was doing in the reserves, you know, and there wasn't, there's no playbook for this, right? Like I would, you know, inform my commanding officer, like, hey, I'm going to Northern Nigeria, you know, and like. What's your take on what happened in, um, in Benghazi? Well, so what I, the, the first thing is that uh, Glenn Doherty and Ty Woods were super good friends of mine. So wow. Glenn, uh, Glenn and I used to CrossFit together. We were CrossFit instructors. I briefly owned a CrossFit gym and, uh, and so, and Ty was my TCCC trauma combat casualty care instructor when I was going through advanced training. Mm. Extraordinary guy, great medic. So I knew those guys super well. Uh, beyond that, I don't really have a take, nor have I even researched it. And I'm not trying to dodge the question. It's just like, no shit, I didn't watch the movie because mm. uh, I just couldn't watch another movie about my friends getting killed. Yeah. You know, I went to Lone Survivor which yeah. was done by Pete Berg with Matt Axelson, who was in, I, who was in my buds class and in my, my the movie team. Lone Survivor. Yeah. Was so by uh, Randall Emmett. Mm, Pete was Berg the, was the director. No, but the producer. Oh, the, him. I don't know. But yeah, like I went to the premiere, I saw that so I could be, you know, close with, I'm close with the Axelson family. Um, you know, but after that experience, I just, yeah, I couldn't I do imagine. another yeah. one. Yeah. It's know? like for me, a Holocaust movie. I just, I can't watch another Holocaust movie yeah. for him. Yeah. Um, when you were doing, when you were doing, um, the war reporting, like, so what did you focus on? Like, how did you decide which conflicts to cover? What was important for you? Um, I was <laughs> like in prep for this, watching the Palm podcast yeah. and he was mentioning that one clip where you just seem chill as hell in the helicopter and you're filming and there's like, there's guns going off and you're just like totally cool, like not phased at all, which is probably obviously because of your SEAL training and your background. Sure. But obviously you have an added edge if you're doing this type of reporting because you can go into conflict zones that probably a lot of people would be very nervous about going into. Yeah. And to be fair, there's a lot of courageous reporters, you know, who are, you know, in places like Ukraine, like, and, you know, different conflict zones around the world who, you know, are willing to put themselves in harm's way to, to sort of tell a story. And, but yeah, by virtue of the nature of my experience, I felt more comfortable than the average bear being in these situations. The funny pre-story that I don't think I told Tony to that is that I had brought this cameraman over there and it was his first war yeah. and we were sleeping in these seventh division army tents, like basically these tents on the front line in the, in the conflict with, with Boko Haram. And, uh, we're in Maduguri, which is in Northern Nigeria. And at one point we were sleeping in these like, you know, canvas tents and the, the Boko Haram guys uh, started mortaring the base that we were on. And my cameraman, like, he like wakes me up. He's like, Oh my God, like there's mortars <laughs> going off. And I sort of listened and you can like listen to like the timing of the detonation yeah. or whatever. I was like, 
yeah, I think it's okay. I just like took my body armor and rolled back over on top of me like a blanket and went back to sleep. Why did you think it's okay? Yeah. I, I could just tell like by the proximity that yeah. like we weren't, that it was an accurate They're fire. Off. It was indiscriminate yeah. fire or whatever. <laughs> um, and, uh, and he left the very next day. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably not this crazy guy. This guy doesn't even care. Yeah. He goes to yeah. sleep. Yeah. yeah, look, and I, I don't fault anybody. Like yeah. it's not, it's, you know, obviously from my time in the teams, like I have a different risk tolerance, you know, yeah. I think I have a different situational awareness, but I also have a different risk tolerance for this stuff. Yeah, I can ask, I mean, it's probably a question you've been asking me a million times, but I got to ask. Can you lie? Can you cheat a lie detector? <laughs> Gotta ask. <laughs> and how do you do it? Did they train you to do those? I mean, I've seen this in movies. Yeah. So I wonder, do they tell you to squeeze or what, what, what is it? Yeah, you... I've heard all kinds of weird stuff like the thumbtack, like yeah. I've heard, you know, the thumbtack in the you booth. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. The like the G-force, like the sphincter, yeah. you know, like tighten up. I've heard all that stuff. Uh, the best advice that that I have gotten. Oh, it's, you guys didn't do it as a part of your training to... Oh, really? Yeah, it's not it's part a of... Myth, it's it's uh, not part of SEAL training, but uh, uh, the best advice I can get is, um, is that I've heard is that uh, you have to have conviction in what you're uh, saying. And if you have true conviction in what you're saying, um, the poly uh, doesn't really work yeah. that well. So, you know, my family was on the intelligence side. So, my, okay. my dad was CSIS, my grandpa was RCMP. Uh, oh, really? Yes, RCMP. So, when I was a kid, the Christmas party, at CSIS headquarters was hooking me up to a lie detector. No way. Yeah, and just seeing if I was lying about, he like, he like, did you clean your room? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is like, the, this is a childhood that I well, had. This is probably the best way to do it. It's oh like God. train them early. Train yeah. 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 So they had the lie detector, whatever the guy was who operated the machine at every, every CSIS Christmas party. So That's <laughs> I feel fun. terrible for <laughs> your, your parents. Like yeah. all they did was teach you to evade that shit exactly. early on. They can Mom, look at me you. now. All yeah. I do is a podcast. Yeah. This is it. I yeah. could have been so much more <laughs> yeah. no. trauma. So I mean, that's that's the that's the that's what my that's what my dad did. That's his entire career. He was all he was all counter counter uh, terrorism and whatnot. But um, <laughs> just just a wild thing <laughs> to have a kid do for a Christmas party. It's kind of an awesome idea. Though. I mean, now, now I'm you thinking, can you buy one on Amazon? I'm yeah, yeah, exactly. You know what? It, it did put the fear of God. I remember. I remember. Um, I didn't smoke for a long time because he told like like weed. He told me if you smoke, it doesn't matter. And like when when your dad's intelligence, like you don't really know what he's capable of. He just seems like a badass. And he told me like, it doesn't matter. Like when you smoke, I can tell for up to a month after you do it. And I'm straight bullshit. Like <laughs> it's like lying to my face, but I was scared shitless. And I didn't smoke for the longest time. It's like, oh my God, he's going to find out. He's going to. So this is awesome. Yeah. I don't so, think we expected this to be a parenting podcast, but, this is a but parenting like, we should like, guys, this is what you tell your children. Yeah. Listen yeah. to scat <laughs> advice on this one. Okay. Just... So I think I turned out okay. But... <laughs> <laughs> um okay so you went okay so you transitioned military media um what is some like walk me like the craziest story that you reported on like what's the the, the wildest experience because obviously you had a ton of um wild experiences while you were active duty but what is like one memorable story that you reported on you know one of the earliest stories that i did the one that got the most national attention it was my first time on national tv was i had myself waterboarded so I had been waterboarded in the SEAL teams. Um, Explain on what water, waterboarded is. Waterboarding is an interrogation technique. Okay. It actually, this is right, like long, boring, like Encyclopedia Britannica history, <laughs> but it actually goes back to like the 1600s to the Dutch East Indies Company. There's all these references throughout history to waterboarding, which is essentially using water as a technique for interrogation. And there, it's been kind of, you know, changed and defined throughout the centuries in terms of uh, what they, how they actually do it. There is a very old school, like Mark Desaad reference to um, waterboarding, which was actually called pumping, where they put so much water in somebody that they, their belly gets distended and all their mm. organs put pressure they on. They drown from the inside out? or It's more like they put like so much internal pressure on their kidneys. Just imagine like drinking and drinking and drinking yeah. water, you know? So that's like a very early primitive form of, of waterboarding. Um, the, it was waterboarding in its sort of current iteration was, you know, conducted by the, 
the Nazis in World War II. And they were actually, some Nazis were prosecuted at Nuremberg for waterboarding. So it has this kind of, in, at least in modern history, this, this long history or this like defined legal history as, as a war crime. Um, I was waterboarded in training when you go through this school that teaches you to resist interrogation called mm-hmm. SEER. They waterboarded me. That was the first time I was waterboarded. And, uh, I remember, you know, you have all this information you're not supposed to tell them or whatever. And they, they put me on the, the waterboard and they put the hose in my mouth and, and did the thing or whatever. And then they, you know, pulled the hose out and I'm like, I'm a SEAL, SEAL Team 1. What do you want to know? You know, yeah. I'll tell you anything you want to know. <laughs> does right. it feel like you're drowning? It does. It really, it really does. does. Yeah, it really? is. It's not, it's primal, man. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. that fear of drowning. Unnatural. Yeah, what I always say, it's like being shackled to the bottom of a pool. Hmm. Like you just, you know. So that, well, didn't the U.S. government get in trouble because of Guantanamo? And not because of Guantanamo. So okay. as far as we know, there's never any waterboarding at okay. Guantanamo. There was something that happened. There was. Okay. Yeah. So, it, and waterboarding became like kind of a through line through my journalism career um, because I had been the first person to do it on national TV. And then later on, I, I did a movie uh, that was that was bought by Amazon, um, written by a good friend of mine, written and directed by a good friend of mine named Scott Burns called The Report. Mm-hmm. Um, and essentially what was happening is at the black sites, the CIA black sites around the world, a, uh, they had brought in a team of outside contractors to do the interrogations. One of those contractors, also a good friend of mine, CIA contractors, a guy named Jim Mitchell. Um, and Jim was responsible for the, the, RDI. That's a real event or that's part of the movie? This is a real event. Okay. Real world, real life. We had all these black sites around the world that we were taking suspects in the global war on terror to and then interrogating them for information. Mm-hmm. The primary guy who did that was my friend, Jim Mitchell from the CIA. And he was a contractor at the CIA, former Air Force psychologist. He personally waterboarded Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who was the architect of 9-11. Okay. Personally waterboarded him 183 times. Wow. Um, and so... Uh, Did he get something out of him? It, it's unclear. Depends who you believe. And in fact, some people believe that that interrogation was the key intelligence linchpin to get Osama bin Laden. Hmm. And some people think it was total bullshit and that we didn't get anything out of those times and that we got all that information from other places. The agency will tell you that it was a necessary part of the interrogation program and that we got actionable intelligence critics of because it, i was thinking we'll say no. if someone breaks like you you stop you stop torturing them yeah so why would if you do it 183 times yeah. it's probably not effective that's the critique of it yeah and the, yeah and i don't like you know after having covered waterboarding been waterboarded multiple times uh like i still just don't know right i, I think there are some ways in which it can be effective um but uh, my understanding, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, is that, you know, is that Israel has closed the door on a lot of those kind of hard interrogations um, because it's not about who they are. It's not about the information that you can get. The ticking time bomb theory is kind of a bullshit theory. Mm-hmm. It's very rarely that all of the circumstances align where this person has the piece of intel that you need to yeah. do the other thing. And it opens up this problem of moral corruption, mm-hmm. right? Um, so, look, this is a complicated subject about, you know, what techniques are appropriate in the global war on terror. And the reason that I, the reason that I it, like did this as an event was for exactly this reason, right? We were having this weird debate in the annals of national security about like, should we waterboard? Should we not waterboard? Right. But nobody knew what the fuck it was. So I said, okay, I'll have myself waterboarded. I'll put it on national TV and like, let's air this debate out for the public. So those kind of pieces, right? And that was, you know, nominated for, you know, awards like Emmys and all this, all this stuff. Um, and then later on, I did an interview with, with my buddy, Jim Mitchell, who had actually conducted this waterboarding at, uh, at these black sites around the world. And I revealed him to the world. He wanted, he wanted to tell his story. So I actually interviewed him here in Florida where he has a vacation home and we were on his canoe, um, with the camera woman 
yeah. uh, on the front filming Jim while we were sort of paddling around this lake surrounded by thousands of alligators because I thought it was a good metaphor for how <laughs> he saw the world. Yeah. Um, and I let Jim tell his side of the story. But look, I'm proud of that one because there's like nothing clean about it. Right. But nobody else could do it. The reason that I could do it was because I knew waterboarding. I knew what was going on. I knew what was happening. And I could bring this, this debate to the public and I could add some value to it. So that was the first very big thing I did. And then throughout my career, um, I continued to do stuff around this, this subject. And for me, like this is the real value of journalism, mm -hmm. right? Is to ask like really hard questions, uh, about about complicated and thorny ethical issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so that's, I think that's what I'm like. Kind and of and what is it like, let's fast forward to 2022. What's this consensus on waterboarding now? So waterboarding has now been under the Obama administration. Um, and remember there's this huge debate, John, nobody remembers, but there was this huge debate. John McCain mm -hmm. took like a stance against waterboarding because he had been tortured at the Hanoi Hilton when he was a prisoner of war in Vietnam. The, the current consensus, uh, well, Pretty much the international consensus prior to the U.S. using it is that it was a war crime and there was a historical and legal precedent for it being considered a war crime. Uh, the U.S. under the global war on terror kind of used uh, like an interesting legal interpretation that said that it wasn't and that it was a legitimate interrogation technique. Lots of people agreed with that. Lots of people disagreed with that. The current status is that Waterboarding is now currently illegal. It's been enshrined into U.S. code. Um, congressional action that happened after this very long Senate congressional inquiry and called the torture report, which is essentially about what the movie is about. Current state, you know, snapshot in time is that waterboarding is illegal. Is there is there, under U.S. law? Under U.S. law, um, and is there uh, like if? based on what you're allowed to speak about, if we were going to try and get information out of a terrorist in 2022, what's the, what's the de facto? What most professional interrogators will tell you is that soft interrogation beats hard interrogation every time. You might get some information from a hard interrogation, like the rough them up kind of stuff, um, but none of that can be corroborated without what is the gold standard of interrogation, which is rapport building, right? Building rapport, Mm. with your prisoner um, and then getting them to trust you and tell you what you want to know. That's what most professional interrogators will say is, is the only, th the only kind of intelligence that you can really be sure of. Because if not, then it's under duress. Mm -hmm. The thing is when I, when I consider that, I mean, you take a hundred people that you interrogate, only a few of them are going to be true professionals that hold real secrets. And then when you say, well, overall, you know, you build report, which makes sense because they talk, most people will talk, most people eventually would cross-reference and, you know, okay, that's a lie, that's not. But that's the majority. The one that really hold the information are most likely a bit trained and they might be better than that. So just because it works for, I mean, you, you want the, the ones that are 2%, right? Yeah. So that's probably where they're going to still ask, like, what else can we do other than just building reports? Yeah. And that's, and like, this is where the debate begins, right? Yeah. And Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, right? All of those waterboarding things, you know, they are not sure if they ever actually got real actionable intelligence mm -hmm. off of him. He's sitting at Guantanamo right now, by the way. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. My other buddy from the agency, John Kiriakou, like ran the op to get, uh, to get him in Pakistan. So wow. yeah, he's, he's sitting in an orange jumpsuit. We should do a round table. Paintings. Yeah. With a couple of your CIA buddy. Yeah. Fun. Yeah. Fun. Yeah. 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 We'll have a who's who in the yeah. zoo of Spookville. Yeah. 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 We'll need more of this. Yeah. <laughs> For those guys, you definitely will. <laughs> yeah. No problem. We got a lot. Yeah. So, um, so do you want to, do you want to walk through kind of what you're working on now? I think that yeah. that sort of summarizes like, like that media, that media portion of your life. Was there anything else you wanted to, to sort of touch on with that? Because I know that like you did a couple of deploy like not deployments, you, you were still active serving, you were doing all these wartime correspondence um, jobs. You won some awards, amazing work. Then you start to transition out of both of those, right? Yeah. Yeah. And look, I, I do think the work in media yeah. is is god's work i'm um, mm -hmm. um, i think it's critically important but part of the reason i transitioned out of media was both a push pull kind of thing the the pull is that i i found another mission that was really important to me uh, but the push is that i think media is fragmented and fucked 
right? And yeah. like this, while I am no longer actively working in media because I'm, I'm you know, heads down, front sight focused on, on building this other company, uh, I do think the kind of work that I was doing, sort of objective truth telling, right? Boots on the ground is really, really critical to our democracy. Before we move on to yeah. the question, who does it right in your opinion? Mm. Mo that, I mean, look, we could do a whole nother podcast I, yeah, no on why the media ecosystem is fucked. Uh, uh, what I will say is not very many people. I think there are some interesting people who are like, who will s still speak truth to power, uh, like, but they're mostly doing it independently, like the Matt Taibis of the mm -hmm. world who have moved over to like a sub stack so and stuff. The Elon files. He was oh, that's right. He did the Twitter files. Yeah, that's Twitter right. Files, yeah, and, file. and like, look, full disclosure, like Matt's a friend. I think he's like an extraordinarily thoughtful, smart guy. He, um, he taught, he coined the term, uh, uh, like what is it? Vampire squid when talking about like venture capitalism. Oh, that's right? funny. Yeah, Vol he calls him. You know, sometimes I mean, he's not. He's not wrong, but <laughs> right, right, yeah. So really powerful, like Tom Wolf style writer, but really independent because I do think that it's very hard to be in an institution, even like an institution that takes itself very seriously. The New York Times, which my grandfather read every Sunday morning, like can still put like a piece of shit article like that Dave Phillips thing. You feel like the New York Times today is not the New York Times, Times from the 70s? I do. I do. I feel like the whole media environment and part of the reason is, you know, we know all the reasons, right? Like the yeah. internet, there's a medium that just does their job, you mm -hmm. know, faster and better. And in this fractured ecosystem it's it's hard to know what's truth so while i am not actively working in media i recognize like how critical it is to our our national discourse you mm -hmm. know but look I, I really don't have a great answer because most of it's pretty bad well, that's why everyone so that's why everyone seeks truth everywhere they can that's why social media is new media right but that's why people try and find these independent uh, journalists like um, matt and all these other very independent because understandably yeah. so true trust in institutions yeah. has broken down yeah you know well i guess i guess the question should be how do you know they're not good right and uh, it comes from all right if i watch cnn and they're consistently saying absolutely and only negative information about trump and then if you look at fox only negative about obama then you know that both of them are biased it could be that a hundred percent is negative it's impossible that everything take the worst person in the world he might say good morning one day and be nice to his butler so just <laughs> it's impossible to go and be absolutely and only negative unless you're biased okay now when they're biased assume everything is wrong start from there and then just try to analyze yeah and i think the problem is bigger than individual journalists, I think the problem is systemic, right? Media mm -hmm. organizations, like everything responds to its incentive systems, right? Their incentive systems are to make money and, yeah. uh, right? So the whole system is incentivized for salaciousness. So I'll give 10 seconds on this because it's one of my pet topics. Uh, in every journalism room, in every newsroom, there's a giant board. I'm talking specifically about digital media um, and it's called uh, Chartbeat. No, I'm too tequila drunk. I think it's called Sharpie. But anyways, there's this big TV right yeah. up there. And they all use this same software and it racks and cracks and leaderboard ranks every article in that has been put out that day. And you see number of views. They have all this good data and metrics on it, right? And journalists are frankly compensated often by how well their articles perform. And we all know human nature that like you put Trump or you put COVID or you put sex in the title yeah. of Move an up. article. So you have a leaderboard. You have a, you have a, you have you have a, a, a clickbait, a clickbait leaderboard. 100%. So what I would say is that the institution of media in the current digital space is incentivized for salaciousness, not for truth. And that's been a disservice to our democracy. But can we blame them? I mean, can we actually blame an organization that is a for-profit organization, but they were trying to report the news, but sometimes the regular news is just not interesting enough compared to a link bait. And in order for them to stay in business and turn the lights on, they must compete with any phony news article like Business Insider or whatever else comes up and they have to just yeah. jump into it. You're 100% like, oh. right. And which is why I'm not blaming the individual institutions. They yeah. respond to their incentives. What I'm, I'm blaming is like the current incentive structure that we have created in digital media. If you think about how the nightly news hour, which used to be the gold standard of news, yeah. how the nightly news 60 minutes, how those things started. They started because the FCC, the government, 
gave all of this valuable bandwidth to the big three, ABC, NBC, CBS, right? Mm-hmm. He said, we're going to give you this FCC airwaves, right? And you're going to like make all this programming that makes all this money because we're giving you this valuable real estate, right? But like there's a there's a clause, there's a catch. And the catch is that for one hour a day, you have to do programming that informs the American public. Mm. And that was the genesis of the nightly news hour. That's how it started. It was never, it was always meant to be a loss leader. It was never meant to keep the lights on or make the money, right? But the government said like, this is the price you pay to make all of that money the other 23 hours hmm. a day, right? I didn't know that. Yeah. It's interesting. Yeah. So. You transitioned into the military and you succeeded and you are succeeding. How did you do that when so many people transition out and So the best way, don't. Th- this, this is an issue and it led me to my, my current uh, endeavor. Um, but for me, what was so good about transitioning out of the military is that I went to graduate school and that provided a soft landing that a lot of people don't study? at Harvard. And you know, what did you study? I studied public policy and IR okay. and international relations. So, and it was so good for me because one of the things that happens to folks when they're transitioning out of the military is, you know, in the military, you're kind of isolated. You don't know a ton of people or other, who are not in the military, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So you miss all of these social networks that have developed from guys who say like went to college and then, you know, interned at Goldman and, and yeah. did all of these other pathways and stuff. So I was lucky that I was able to, you know, to go to this like prestigious university and meet all of these people who were very different than the people I had been interacting with, you know, in, in, during my time in the service. I think about it. You went to the best unit in the world and you went to the best school in the world. It's like a Superman. You see when people try to <laughs> inspire, like, well, I mean, that's kind of hard. Like, you know, what rem- you know but it's all been downhill <laughs> since there. You know? <laughs> it reminds me that there was this meme. I don't even know if it's true. There's this guy who was like a, a Navy SEAL, then an astronaut, and then a doctor, an MD or something. Oh, Johnny Kim. Yeah. Do you know that? <laughs> yeah. Do you know what they call person? him? You know what they call Yeah. He is a real person. They call him the most eligible Asian bachelor in America. Oh, that's so funny. Right. Like there are Asian moms over there who are like specifically grooming, you know, Mrs. Kim. You know, so, funny. Like, yeah. so you're almost there. Yeah. You know? I mean, <laughs> you're going to be an astronaut that yeah. you're good. You're yeah. good. Yeah. I mean, yeah. like you can substitute MD for highly successful entrepreneur, and then you have to do a third thing. I actually, I get, journalist is there, but journalist is an astronaut. That is, journalist is not <laughs> astronaut, man. That is, that is the raw truth. And you're like my dad, keeping me humble, you know? Yeah, well, actually, astronaut those days is not that hard. You just go and uh, Blue For Origin Elon. or with yeah. Elon. And you, you just, if, oh. you have, if you have like 30 grand, you go with uh, Blue Origin for 90 seconds. You go up and they come down. I'm an astronaut. Yeah. You guys, I just did zero G. Oh, how was it? Do you it? know it? Yeah, you know so it's a, the jet that goes. Yeah, yeah. they do. You this were telling way. me about that when we met. Yeah, okay. they do that this was the night before or something. The day before. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah, we saw each other uh, at at the pool. Yeah, yeah. I I had gone. So a good friend of mine. I don't even know if he wants to be mentioned. We'll just call him DM. Good friend of mine. Really like philanthropic guy had like donated to this cause. And when one of the things that he had gotten out of the cause was that a, one of these parabolic flights for like him and his friends. So it's like me, my buddy, Dave, right? Like 10 blonde girls, 10 hot blonde girls, a few other (laughs) accessory friends, like all went on this parabolic flight and you know, like I've done a lot of cool stuff. Like I parachuted yeah, out yeah. of an airplane at 30,000 feet, right? Like I've, you know, been in a nuclear submarine, slept next to a weapon of mass destruction. But that 90 seconds of like being an astronaut weightless was so cool. Man. That is very like, cool. Yeah, it was awesome. So what, what are they doing it out of? So, so the guy who runs the company is really interesting CEO, a guy named Matt Goad. Uh, he just took over the company about six months ago. They're doing most of it here in Florida. And they spend, a, I think they do a half, I'll have this, the ratios off, but they do about like half their flights for the public um, as kind of an interesting and experience. Half and then, yeah, they use the, yeah. the same plane to help NASA astronauts get acclimated to weightlessness. Yeah. I, feel, I feel like it became more of a thing when... Uh, when they're shooting uh, Apollo 14 or 13 with uh, a, with uh, Tom Hanks. Yep. And they had to actually shoot with zero gravity. And I think that was the first time when they introduced it to the public outside of NASA. Where they Is that said, true? What yes. year was that? That was a while oh, back. That was 90s, I want to say, or, or yeah. early 2000s. And it was, it was back then because ultimately you just have to go down at a particular uh, speed uh, in a particular, I guess, uh, slope. 
Yeah. And then you're going to be at zero gravity and they can say, okay, we can do it for like, I don't know, 15 seconds and then we, or less, like or like 10 seconds and then you go back up. You were 90 seconds. Down. No, you no but you did it multiple six, times, right? We did 15, but each one, in, it depends on like the actual flight profile that they fly, but each one ends up being somewhere between like 45 and 90 seconds. Oh, okay. So, okay. so it's pretty one, okay. good, but they did 15 different They shot a whole movie, I mean, not a whole movie, but a big piece of the movie yeah. this way where you see, you see him sitting down and they they go and they go to zero gravity. He's been already in space and he takes off the gloves and you see the gloves. And at first you ask, how are they doing this? It was and the first how. time. It There's was no CGI. That's how, yeah. yeah. It was, that was and, wild. And we did some cool stuff. Like the girls brought Skittles and stuff. So yes, right. Oh my yeah. God, that's so funny. And then when they like threw the water in the air. But the only criteria for anybody who ever is lucky enough to get to do it or, or have a friend like Dave, the only criteria is like definitely don't party the night before. Oh, um, because like you don't want anybody thrown up at that point. It just yeah. gets weird in, in zero gravity. But did anyone get not? No, everybody was great. Oh, yeah. You know great. how much it costs? Five grand. I think it costs a little more. I think it's uh, a little well, more. Inflation. Yeah, yeah. I think it's I, a little north of that. Yeah. yeah. I don't know the But it's around, numbers. at the time, it was five grand. Oh, five. I, it yeah, wasn't I don't know if you I thought it was going to be like a hundred grand or something like this. Not, well, to rent the whole plane, it is. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I think you can go up as an individual and it's. I think it's definitely worth it. Yeah. Those. The, the, this is an, an interesting time in America where where people that that were kind of like the echo chamber that you meant you keep bringing up social media yeah, social media echo, echo chamber, chamber people just don't see the other side because the mm -hmm. the platform shows you what you want to see and then people it's horrible believe that this is the reality and you can shape reality and it's dangerous i mean if you go back to joseph goebbels mm -hmm. how they shaped reality for good people making them believe that other people are bad and it's okay to go and gas them. It's just, this is literally what we're doing to each other just for the name That's of profit. Right. Not even as a, as an evil reason, just it is what it is. To yeah. drive engagement and views yeah. and likes. Totally. And it's totally wild. It's insane. I think, I think we even understated it when we were talking about it. It's dangerous right now. Very dangerous. Yeah. 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 Um, what were we talking about? Oh, so we never, so we should go back into, um, your life post yeah. military so we never really got into that so you transitioned out yeah um no we so, were talking about oh yeah taking a piss taking a piss yeah yeah, that's yeah. Right. you know in in buds like the nicest thing you can do for like one of your buddies is like take a piss on him right like <laughs> you're so cold and you'd be <laughs> like oh warm. that guy has the warmest pee oh my god <laughs> <laughs> no, so, so you're still you're still allowed to stay in. You didn't you didn't, you didn't tap out or yeah, yeah, or whatever. You're yeah, good. Yeah. Um, okay, so you got your masters, and and then what? Ne what's next? Yeah, I got my masters, and then I worked in media for a decade. And concurrently with that, I did a lot of work in the veteran service space. So you're I helped, close to it. Yeah, exactly. Trying to give veterans a renewed sense of mission and purpose, uh, and that's really important because a lot of veterans we've found have struggled when they've come out. You know, and even in the special operations community, this is a pretty serious issue, right? You go from being this rock star with a really like important sense of self and mission. And then sometimes you hit the civilian world and, and you don't know yeah. how to define who you are, much less what to do. So I found for, for many years that helping give people a new mission in public service was really important. So we've had veterans doing amazing things to help out in their, their local communities. What I came to believe in the last several years though, is that while purpose is important, so is purse, right? And that a lot of veterans and military folks have been struggling economically. In large part, the private wealth community has really left the military community behind, um, both from like an actual numbers perspective. Explain what that means. I don't understand. So what do you mean by the, the private wealth left them behind? There's, there's, there's not a, company that's serving the military for personal wealth building and, okay right um there's you know their civilian socioeconomic peers are outpacing our our military uh community folks by a large margin partially because they're underpaid but also because they there's a lack of financial literacy in the military community and i got like a bazillion sea stories about like dumb shit you know, military folks have done with their money that sort of underscore the point. But there is a bunch of kind of trade winds blowing. One was a change in the military retirement system. Another was... What do you mean? What happened with that? They went from a uh, def de uh, defined benefit system, the pension, basically. Mm -hmm. You put in your 20 and then you get a portion of your pay for the rest of your life to a contribution-based system, essentially a 401k. You right? don't have a defined benefit. 
anymore? No, it's now it's a it's called the TSP. Right? That's wild. The thrift savings plan. It's so essentially Canadian, a foreign government still has to find benefit. Right. As as it, I mean, no private has it anymore, but most government, from what I know, still has to find benefit, which is like the de facto standard pension, like our grandparents had. Right? That's right. Do you? That's yeah. right. But you know, and look, I'm not actually judging that model. Right. In some ways, there were some advantages to it. It before you had to do your 20. If you did 19 years and 364 days and got out, you didn't get anything. Yeah. You got jack. Right. So there is a world in which. It makes more sense. You do four years, you get that 401k-ish thing started. We call it the TSP, and then you can mm. transfer it over to your civilian career. There are pros and cons. Like, you know, the one thing I learned at Harvard was yeah. that there's pros and cons to all policy, yeah. right? Um, but with that change, what they really needed to do is now you're asking 18-year-olds to make complex financial decisions about their future, and they un- ill-prepared them and under-equipped them to do so. And the military has started to recognize this. Um, They've actually recognized financial literacy as a critical national security issue. Mm. It's affecting readiness because guys have financial problems and they're not ready to deploy, guys and gals. <laughs> the caveat, I know you guys aren't super PC. I come from a community of all men. So like when I say military, my like de facto no, no, thing is we're not guys. gonna judge you. Okay, we're right, good right, people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, there's also women who are serving at yeah, who have the yeah. same problem, right? And, they, yeah. and especially like coming from the Israeli military, like serve side by side, right? W- women have compulsory service 100%, also, right? Yeah, and women, women serve almost in anything. Uh, there are some, I mean, I don't think they do SEALs, but today there can be pilots and yeah. Yeah, and it's compulsory service yeah, as well, right? Service. Yeah, so, uh, so anyways, um, so I started to recognize that this problem existed in the military community where military folks were were sort of underrepresented in financial services. And you would think um, like USAA, especially when it comes to personal investing and stuff would kind of own the market because you see the football commercials Mm -hmm. and all this stuff. But USAA uh, exited the investing side of the business uh, a couple of years ago. They sold it off to Charles Schwab. What's USAA? Ah, USAA is kind of the preferred banking institution for the military. You have to be military affiliated. Um, Most service members use USAA to some degree. It's a big bank that only serves the military. They don't they don't do investing in you literally go on the USAA website and yeah. you watch any football game, you'll see like big military oh, yeah. advertisements. They, they spend money on that. I've seen them before. They spend money on advertising. Huge. And look, I'm a USAA. But customer. they don't but they don't go and they don't do investing. Do, I got you. They don't do investing. Like every other bank in the world which That's would. Right. Yeah. So you literally go on the USAA website and you click investing and it redirects you to Charles Schwab. Hmm. Right. So wow. as as both an entrepreneur and a mission-oriented founder who cares about the health and wealth of the military community, I saw this market of people that was being underserved. Um, mm. And so I started this company called Guild. Um, and with the idea that we could kind of take draw a circle around this community, uh, get them on board, and then pull up the ladder behind us. Um, and that's what I've been doing for the last year and a half, like trying to use all my, my SEAL skills Right and apply yeah. them to entrepreneurialism uh, to help. So, close what does it do this- exactly? So, if say I'm um, I'm a veteran, I come down to you and I said, "All right, uh, how do you help me? Do I put money with you and you kind of like a fund and uh, you can manage the money portfolio, even if it's a little bit, but you can say." You come up with a couple hundred thousands, you know, as, as a Cornell or something like that. We're going to go and put that money to work for you. Yeah. I mean, if a couple hundred thousand, you mean by a couple hundred thousand pennies? Like, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, whatever it is. <laughs> I mean, I'm just throwing a number. Yeah, of course. No, no, no. I'm joking. Uh, so what it is, it's a self-directed investing platform. So think about Robin Hood, mm. but oriented towards the military community. Mm. Um, so in large part, we did that because that's where the market is, right? Mm. A lot of young sailors, airmen, marines, they don't trust traditional financial institutions and they want to have control of their own finances. Um, So we don't even think of it as veterans. We think of it as like the full service members journey. So like day one, week one, you're in the military. Yes, you're making less amounts of money, but you have lots of things covered. So you have more discretionary income than you think. Um, And we want military folks to start investing early because I think of it kind of like I think of wellness, right? We're all fit guys. We all like working out, right? It's um, just like working out. It's really hard to get in shape overnight in one workout, but it's pretty easy to get fit over like a long period of time Mm -hmm. if you're consistent and you're disciplined. 
The same is true with being wealthy, right? Um, it's really hard to get rich in a day, right? You might hit the crypto lottery or whatever, yeah. less likely now, yeah, less likely right? Now. Yeah. <laughs> right, or whatever. <laughs> but if you, but over time, it's actually easy to accumulate wealth, right? The genius, the miracle of compound interest and all of this mm -hmm. stuff. Um, so that's what we want to do. We want to get people like investing early um, with a financial institution that they trust because we share their military DNA using this like discretionary income that they have. And, and how many, so to, to put it in perspective, how many active and, and, and retired service members could you serve? Yeah. So USAA uh, is something like 17 million members. So that's a their huge user base, huge user base. But I, to put a wrinkle on it, I don't actually think that's the market. Right. That's an important market. Right. And let's say you can capture some percentage of that market. I had this thesis early on and I've had some data to prove it that, yes, we need to serve the military community. And a huge portion of our platform is financial literacy. So and we believe in it so much that like literally you watch the knowledge video mm -hmm. that's oriented towards military guys uh, and we'll put five dollars in your brokerage account to invest. So with fractional shares, you yeah. know, you could buy you know, $5 worth of Apple or a dollar no, worth of Apple no. and a dollar worth of Amazon, right? Um, so financial education, right? But we also think that there's this large community um, that exists to support the military. Um, and with this lack of trust in financial institutions, we said like, hey, we want to be the most trusted financial institution and investing platform. And our thesis was that people would migrate over uh, just not who are military affiliated, but who are what I call the I made this term up, the Patriot market, yeah. people who want to support the military also. So like, why not, like, why invest with Robin Hood, mm. right? They, you know, probably shouldn't call them out directly, but whatever, you know, They're competitors. Three, three tequilas in, you know, yeah. like, like why invest with, with Robin Hood, right? Yeah. Especially after like, the, there's still this kind exactly. of hangover yeah. from the GameStop fiasco and all this stuff. And there's this lack of trust. And even post 2008, there's a lack of trust in financial institutions, right? So we want to position ourselves and we think we live our values as the most tr trusted financial institution in the game. And so- When I, because I was thinking the natural one uh, right next to military or service people, if it's firefighters, if it's going to be cops yep. and then bring it to the big group. Because, That's exactly yeah. right. That's exactly right. And people, and I, I knew this happened because I went on, this is, a, this is a funny story, but I went on Newsmax like on a Sunday morning in August because my friend is an anchor on Newsmax. Newsmax, right wing, yes. like leaning. They, they sort of became popular during COVID. Exactly, yeah. right? And like, I don't know how many people are watching Newsmax on like a Sunday morning at, you know, 7 a.m. West Coast time. Probably not that many, right? In mid-August, <laughs> yeah. right? Everybody's on vacation or whatever. Uh, but after I talked to my friend Carl Higby, who's the answer about this, we had like 100 people sign up. But more important, we had a bunch of people who wrote us who said like, hey, I'm not a veteran, but I like what you guys are doing with the military and I want to move my account from Robin Hood or Ameritrade yeah. mm -hmm. over to you guys because I want to invest with people who are aligned with my values. So we do what's called an ACATS transfer. People just transfer their whole 100%, portfolio. 100% people are going to be 100% comfortable with that. I think that there's going to be uh, a lot of shift if you're going to start introducing solutions. Because if, if I watch right now anything that's in institution, board, I can't get out of it, okay? But I have to listen to the brainwash, okay? It's like, and I know that Robin Hood is not a political organization, right? But in, in that case, I understand that because you said, I am going to be a patriot. It's, it's bipartisan, but I am a patriot first. So let's go and people would move into it. Yes. That's right. So we just did this. And so that was kind of like the first like proof positive data point that I got, you know? And then, you know, we're just coming off Army Navy weekend. We did this big tailgate with uh, this company, Nine Line, that does apparel. Black Rifle mm -hmm. Coffee Company, mm -hmm. my friend Jocko. Oh, they're, they're getting big now too, Black Rifle. I've heard of them yeah, everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And they just, they just went public and yeah. those guys are friends of ours, right? Yeah. And Black Rifle, they kind of opened the kimono and showed us some of their, their data. 84% of Black Rifle customers, there's no more market that's more saturated than coffee, right? Yeah. Like, but that's 80, commodity now. That's a, it's commodity. It's crazy, yeah, right? Yeah, so how it. are these guys doing so well, these upstart veteran guys? Yeah, yeah, they put out some cool videos and all this stuff. But the truth is that according to their own internal data, 84% of their customers buy Black Rifle Coffee because they want to support the military. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and we're kind of the same way, right? There's this, what I call the Patriot Affinity Market, this Patriot group that wants to be aligned with, you know, companies that support the military. And when you start to look at the market there, 
now you're not just talking about 17 million people for USAA. You know, you're talking 100 million people. Yeah. Well, I just think it's it's wild that there aren't more companies that are aligned with the military. The fear, the fear to go out and stand, um, I am a U.S. patriot and get You know canceled. how disgusting it that is? is that there's fear. a fear of being patriotic? Yeah. Yes. And, and like... That's the problem the, that, is this is horrible and this is reality. That's right. And the problem is that it's been politicized, right? Yes. They think that saying like, I am a patriot means that I am a Republican or I am a conservative. Yeah, and they I are minorities. Right. Yeah. And they're wrong, right? 100%. They're wrong. I think of, of, of our company and I think about the patriot market in general, the same way I th thought about, you know, when I was like kicking doors overseas, right? Yeah. Like I, I didn't care when I was going into like a house, a Taliban house, whether the person behind me was like a Democrat or Republican. Yeah. I never stopped to ask. Yeah. All I cared about is that you're on the mission with me. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're on the mission to support the military community, like red, white, or purple it doesn't, doesn't mean shit. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's, it should be bipartisan and bipartisan, but it's, it's not like, I, I feel like the brainwashing machine is, look, I, I watched this uh, show on, um, on Hulu and I honestly just sign up just because someone told me to watch that show. Otherwise, I never really thought of signing up for Hulu because I have enough already. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I do oh, have. I came yeah. for one show, but <laughs> so it called Fleshman. I think it's Fleshman or Fleshman or something like that is in trouble. It's basically about a Jewish doctor in New York City that got divorced and he wasn't kind of like uh, the spring chicken when he was young. Nobody really cared. No, no girls ever cared for him, but because he was kind of like a geek, he stayed geek, but this time he's a geek doctor and he's like 40. So he goes on dating apps and he gets laid every night with another girl, like a black, Chinese, white, and whatever you can imagine because now he's a doctor. Excuse right? me, I'm listening. I'm just signing so now, up for Hulu while you talk. So anyway, <laughs> anyway, you watch it and it's it's an awesome show. It's an awesome show, right? And his wife, he, he, like, they demonize his wife like you can't imagine. They made her look worse than Osama bin Laden. Over. <laughs> She's a horrible human being. She just abandoned her kids and she just disappeared and just not a good person. Just a dislikable person. And and then he goes and, and the, but the thing is the way they, so they give you this product that you're supposed to consume after hours where you want to become like half dead, brain dead and you watch it. And in between, they're showing you kind of like those little snippets for you to hate people that are Republican. And they're showing you, well, he goes and he hangs around his wife's friends that he doesn't like because they're rich. And as, as, a, as a piece of the puzzle, rich or bad, and they're just assholes and all the care of they, they throw these passive aggressive comments because he's just a doctor making fun with that. And he's basically saying, yeah, this is Johnny. And uh, there's a narrator in the back that says, this is Johnny. And what you're going to see is a picture of him and Donald Trump's son uh, killing a black giraffe. Just some, just make them like bad. And you just, then they keep on moving. And then eventually he goes and he has sex with this lady that tells him, well, I'm technically married to uh, a person that is an anchor in a very Republican news uh, outlet. Which one? Carson is like, I can't say. And then one day I called him with uh, his assistant, which is, got, is a male, is male, and he was going down on him. And I'm not supposed to go and uh, tell this to anybody. So I can't tell you, but I live my life. He lives his life. And like, which one? Carson? Just the demonization of the other side is horrible. Yeah, and it's and it's a good show. Just yeah, check yeah. it off. I'll watch the show. But yeah. now I, I, I wish there was something else that would give it to me without all this brainwash. I have this hope. Like this could be like total naivety and like rose-colored lens optimism. I have a hope that all of that that kind of programming is going to be ultimately rejected by the consumers. That like people they know when they're being manipulated. At the end of the day, I still have like faith. Um, in like the American people or in the public to be discerning consumers of information. Mm -hmm. Now that hope is like, you know, is, is dashed every day, right? When I see something, but look, I, I get it. I think the, the issue there is like without like real like media understanding, there's almost this like inception level of programming mm -hmm. that happens in that where like, we're taught to hate. A hundred percent. Subliminally. Yeah, yeah you, you're happening. subliminal. Exactly. It's very subliminal. I feel like it's not going to happen if you're going to have a, a, something like, say, I mean, you really don't have any alternative for streaming services uh, like Netflix. 
Right. But, on the but, other but, side, but you ratings, really don't. ratings speak louder than anything, and revenue speaks louder. And no, I mean when on the, the streaming the ones, services. Yes, but you, I mean, you have, things you have, that are. I, I don't care about that. A show includes maybe a little bit of negative about one or the other, but like hyper woke is no longer in vogue. I don't think it is anymore. I don't think that. I don't think people appreciate it because ultimately, what that does, hyper woke is actually very bad because then it creates hyper right wing. Yes, and it creates these two the, and these two groups, polarities. Uh, yeah, two saying. polarities, and I've never experienced this until I came down to the U.S. The polarities here are, and the average person you speak to is not. Far and it's right, not like that in left. Canada. That not at all, not at mm. all. But in Canada, the narrative is that we're center right, center left. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., the narrative is you do have these two very divisive groups that are not willing to meet anywhere yeah. across the aisle. So I think that. I think that the average person is sick of that shit and the average person doesn't want to hate and the average person doesn't want to, I don't give a shit if you're a Republican or Democrat, if you're a good person, if you're a smart person, I can vibe with you no matter what. But yeah. the thing is the, the, uh, the world and COVID, it, it, it basically kept everybody at home and everybody was online and online basically made everyone else hate each other. And I always speak about echo chambers, I speak about social media and echo chambers. And when you post something on social media, you have a view. And then when you post that view, the, the social media platform, doesn't matter what it is, it slots you into the algorithm with like-minded people. And then all you see is similar views. And then it starts to show you views that are slightly even more aggressive than yours. And then you think that's the norm and you don't see the other side. And then all of a sudden you do see the other side once in a while, but it's just demonized. And yeah. And the Overton window has shifted so correct. much that like yeah. we've forgotten what normal is. Also the, the, they'll go and they'll censor what they want to censor. Uh, it's been, it's been weird to see how they censor everything that's really not important to censor. And then there are some things, I mean, if, if you're going to go and see someone, I'll give an example, there was a shootout in, uh, in Iran where the choppers were shooting into the crowd, killing hundreds of people. We're not showing it. We're not talking about that. There was a shootout in Israel where a Palestinian came in with, uh, with an AR, started shooting civilians. A police officer, which was also Muslim Arab, came in. They shot each other. They both died. We're not going to show that. It was suppressed. And then just let's not talk about that. When Israel retaliate, oh, let's talk about that. Let's go and let's go and, and kind of like deceive. Let, whenever there is a Palestinian uh, shooting out uh, in Israel and he gets shot, the, the Tal would say a Palestinian uh, was shot, uh, was killed in a shootout in Israel. After shooting three Israelis, and it's just very, very biased. So then if you go and you read from the other side, of course, you're going to have animosity because you only read the title and you're going to say they're horrible people, right? But they're not showing you the whole picture. Now, to say Israel is perfect, no. To say the Palestinian, no, no one is perfect, but just show the news, show what happened, be objective. That's, that's all you have back to do. your original point. It is. About why you actually were in media and why that's, that's the work that people have to do. 100%, 100%. And like, look, I do think... We're at a extraordinarily challenging era where people don't know what truth is, and that's really hard. I will say we have had these periods in history before. We had the yellow journalism, you mm -hmm. know, of the early part of the century. Um, they and, call it today drama channels. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. Yeah, but I, my hope is that it at some point is self-correcting, right? But not self-correcting like, oh, it's just magically going to happen. It takes good people to do hard work mm. right in order yeah. in order to do and there's people are working on interesting things you know I, i'm invested in this company that you know is essentially about puts filters on your news diet right not filters like this is what you see this is what you don't see but filters so you at least know mm. what explicit context you have context yeah so you have context right yeah. like think about it like everything we put in our body like the tequila we're drinking right super healthy by the way yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sponsored by yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, you know like you know the 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 crackers we had downstairs it, it all has a nutrition label right yeah. we know whether it's like full of sugar or you know like what the mm. what's inside it what we're putting into our body yeah. right but there's no warning label there's no nutrition label for the news and information that we consume there's nothing that tells you that this has a right leaning bias or that this has a left uh, leaning mm. bias so yeah. you know so like i'm you know, I'm invested with this company Seeker. Like, who knows if they will succeed? All but it's 
that's needed. Oh, it's but the idea, much. the that premise would be, is right. That would be amazing if you finally see this this news outlet is leaning towards the left and have yeah. yeah. And then you can choose. You can choose if you want to eat cotton candy and you Every know that there's day. you know 120 grams exactly. of sugar. You can choose that, right? Yeah. But at least like we got to start the process of understanding what we're consuming. Yeah, I, I love it. I love it. Yeah, this is it's okay to go and put any opinion, but when you're a news anchor and you say that you're reporting the news, but you're actually manufacturing the news or you're many curating, the, curating, curating. The news, yes, uh, <laughs> so it's uh, yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and by the way, it goes both ways. I don't think they have real, but like the Fox News is not objective, right? They're not, so it, it goes both ways on the other side. Not to say that, that, that there's, yeah, but uh, yeah, and, and then you said you really need both sides, or you just yeah, you can go all the way to the left, but it would be nice to have one in the center that actually tells you what happens. You don't have to read between the lines every time. And yeah. There are, but they're not as popular. <laughs> they're not as popular. No one's going to read it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard, right? Like even, you know, even on the, on the company, on the, on the mission side, right? We're talking about like financial literacy, right? Like it's still a product of knowledge, right? At the end of the day, if you're asking people to invest you have to be able to do research you have to yes. be able to like understand sources and primary sources and you have to make educated decisions so it bleeds into all domains of life right it's not yeah. just about reading the news right it's also it's it's, it's the it's a sim it's the it's the symptom of just over information like too much information constant influx of information so much noise never know what's true and if you don't have a trusted source to go to to learn for financial education or, or anything it's just massively overwhelming That's and you're right. just bound to make a bad decision at one point so you you actually guide them through this whole financial journey their entire life basically their entire professional life is what you're trying to yeah do. from the start of the service member life that's the that's the idea right and, and then what's the so what's the reality of a of you know we spoke about some of the things they spend money on what do they spend money on well, you know, listen, you grab any, you, you pull any veteran into this podcast and they will like give you a story about like stupid shit people spent their money on. Like I'll give you my, my top one, which is one of my favorites. There was, uh, there was, I, I'll, I'll give you a funny one and then I'll give you a more serious one. The funny one is that there was a guy in, in one of my platoons, uh, like pipe hitter. Right. He was this, the 60 gunner, meaning he carried the 60 machine gun, which is like a short barreled in the army. It's a crew served weapon. Three guys operate it in the seal teams. We like chop off the barrel and one guy one holds it. Yeah. We call him the pig gunner, right? <laughs> Here's 500 rounds of ammunition on a belt around. Is it, is it, uh, is it 50 cow? It's seven, six, two. Okay. Seven, yeah, six, so okay. seven, six, two. Yeah. yeah. And it's got these, these, these big drums and it's, uh, it's an open bolt, right? Okay. So you slap that yeah. feed tray down. Yeah. yeah. And then Big boom, 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 boom. Yeah. And then you just rock and roll on yeah. it. Right. But you know, it's like carrying 20 pounds in your hands. So the guys who, who, who are the pig gunners are usually the biggest, strongest guys in the platoons. And, uh, anyways, we had this, this pig gunner in my platoon. He comes in, uh, in the military, you get paid twice a month, uh, and you get paid on Thursday night, direct deposit. So if I, I scheduled a, training on Saturday morning, I would sort of do this as a leader to kind of moderate the yeah. guys going out and partying too hard. I, so every two weeks I would do this. So I'd schedule training on Saturday morning. This guy comes into the platoon hut on Saturday morning. He's like, Hey LT, uh, can I talk to you for a second? So, you know, I went out, uh, uh, Thursday night when we got paid at midnight and, uh, I went out and I met this, this dancer stripper and, uh, we went to Vegas and we eloped. And we got oh. married and I was like, all right, man. So Monday morning, like went down, like we got it annulled, you know, like all good. Right. Like, Hey man, I understand happens, you know? And, uh, anyways, fast forward to the next pay period. That doesn't happen. First of all, it doesn't just happen. It still seems it happens. <laughs> It happens. <laughs> it happens. Once you get out of the base, you probably want to just party. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. These guys go on. Anyways, fast forward to the next pay period. Saturday morning, I schedule training again, 7 a.m. You walk into the platoon hut. Guys have started IVs on themselves. And they're, you know, sucking oxygen off the Draeger, which is pure yeah. oxygen, trying to, like, get ready for training the day. Same guy comes up to me. Hey, LT, I, I got to talk to you. You know, we got paid, went out, met this girl. We went to Vegas. It's the same guy. Same guy. Two weeks in a row no, no and i had to go get two marriages i'm not like okay you're done man you're you're cut off like no more or whatever so that's the funny story the serious story is when i started the company guild um one of the first things i did is seals of my generation went to jump school at fort benning georgia uh which is in um 
Columbus, Georgia. And I mapped from the front gate where people enter the gate to the first used car dealership Hmm. uh, where you could buy that new Dodge Challenger or Mustang at like 19, 20, 21% interest rate, 0.3 miles. They literally have it so that guys could walk Hmm. off the base, right? And get uh, a Mustang because like, look, you got this steady government paycheck. Like, we'll give you credit, yeah. right? Doesn't matter. And, but like, I don't know what 20% compounding means. But it's way more than stuff. the car is worth. Way more, right? And so guys get underwater right away. So there's all of these institutions, you know, I call them predatory, but there's all of these institutions that are designed to take military service members' money, money yeah. right? And, you know, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to be a counterfactual to that, right? Mm-hmm. We wanted to help military guys increase their money over their lifetime. Yeah, interesting. So they they are targets basically for of creditors course. here of course. in their own backyard. Exactly. And that's the the first rule that you want to do is while they're in the service, you have not to wait for them to finish, but to do it before. Because we spoke about this, there's that there's uh, the theory, uh, the show bowlers, where it's while they're players or after their players, how to help them manage your money. Over here, it's before they just get the first paycheck. Someone has to yeah. walk them through. And look, I don't think it's ever really too late you know, yeah. to, to start this, but the earlier you can become cognizant of this, I think uh, this, that, that, that should be in my, look, so I have a 13 year old girl and eight year old boy. And my daughter told me, why don't they teach us about money? Why don't they teach us about banks? Why don't they teach us anything? And, you know, honestly, I never thought about teaching children about this, but I told them I'll teach you that. But we're, we're sending them to school where, you know, I get the whole part where the first 12 years has to be very generalist part. So eventually when you go to school, when you go to college, you go zoom in into particular thing, but they'll teach you everything except money. They'll even teach you, they'll give you drama classes, chorus, like throw it out the window. That's not important. It's just <laughs> teach them how to manage money. And then by the time they go to school, you don't need to tell them that 20% interest rate on their car is a theft. That's right. Right. That's, that's so yeah. basic to go and explain that. There's I think, a, I think some schools are getting better. They are. I mean, and I, I think, think even no, here in is, Florida, yeah, right. They yeah. mandated they financial they literacy. Just, yes. They just, yes. So, yes. Or they 2022. Just right. So, I mean, like. It's yeah. a little bit late, but like yeah. fair, <laughs> fair point. Yeah, no, but like, better late than never. Well, yeah, I, I don't think other states do it. I think no, they the don't. First state, so I mean, give it to. It's really bad. Well, I think I think that we're talking about active duty military members, but I mean, ballers, football, hockey, NBA. I'm pretty sure now in in college, university, uh, financial literacy courses are required for anyone who plays uh, like semi or like college athletics. Really? I think so. Some schools. Just because like the the bankruptcy rate post career is enormous. Enormous. Yeah. You have, I mean, like think about if you were 20 years old and you got a check for 10 million or 20 million dollars and you've never worked a job or even understood taxes, you know, there's people I've 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 interviewed people. Um, I interviewed Chris Pronger, I was talking about and he and he uh wrote a thread about all the financials to do with professional athletes, but he knows guys that they spent their first paycheck before they even got it. And it was like a $10 million paycheck. And it was like then 5 million after tax. And then it was house, car, They go into a debt house before for, they even started. Right. House for parents, agent fees, which is like 10 or 20%. Uh, there's all these different yeah, up fees. Until now, it was, it was up until, I can't like, it, even, even if you look at entrepreneurs, most of them don't have, don't understand money. They just know how to sell and build something. There was a part where I, before I sold my business, my partners, my first partners told me a story. And they said, well, we had this business we invested in and there were three founders. One was the main guy and there were two that were sweat equity. So the two guys that had the biggest piece after right when we sold, they made sure to move to Texas so they don't pay the, uh, the, the tax in California. The one that got the least amount and he was getting about 5 million. He went and the first thing he did, he went and he bought a house for 6 million because they had a little leftover equity in it. And he thought it's going to be a hundred million dollar. And he went and he told him those people moved to Texas to save money and they got 20, 30 million each. He went, the guy with the least amount of money bought a more expensive house than what he actually, and so it can happen to very, very smart, successful people that are business people and they just lose it all after the exit. It's just how so come, imagine if you never had any education, imagine right. nothing and you yeah. were around people with money and it still happened. So right. imagine. 
So, I, and I'm just super curious, like how is, how is Guild doing now? Like build, okay, you're building, this is your first time as an entrepreneur, technically, right? So you're yeah, building- First time as, a, certainly as a tech entrepreneur, so I've had small a, businesses before, company. but this is my first big so business. So build, building a tech company for the first time, yeah. you're building highly regulated, I'm assuming. Yep. Um, basically a, a comparable to a Robinhood or any other 100%. investment platform. And the so compliance how, piece is obviously so like- That's a it, pain it, in the ass. <laughs> It is. And it's super onerous. And I'm super grateful for how onerous it is, right? Because ultimately, like these industries should be regulated when you're talking about people's people's money. By the way, so so in your your case, when you want to go and you have two parts for your platform, right? If I want to go and trade any stocks, you have the the interface and then you have the back end where every transaction has to be processed with lots of regulations. Do you own that piece or do you the the back end or you own only most and then you license from someone to go and do the back end? Because that is extremely hard to, to yeah. build. So almost all of the businesses use like pro- professional clearing houses. Apex is kind of the okay. largest one. So we clear through Apex, okay. uh, like Robinhood and, yeah. and I think Ameritrade. A few businesses are self-clearing. Robinhood may have gone self-clearing now, um, but there's another regulatory compliance piece. To the customer, none of this is none of this yeah, matters you don't at see all. all those, you yeah. go on the app, you buy your your Apple or your Tesla stock, right? Yeah. And then you, like you make smart business decisions and you watch your account grow. Um, but yeah, right now we are not self clearing, although you know, not that it's important, no, it's but in our up, yeah. in our future we yeah. will be. Yeah, you know what I would um, suggest. I think it's a missing piece from a lot of those. Where if you can have an easy integration for all kind of uh, algobat trading, where it can be a layer above that. Where you can say, look, I mean, you can trade. I mean, some people are day traders. And if they are day traders, they'll use like, candlesticks and like resistant points. And computer would always do it better based on the strategy. So I don't know any platform that organized, a str- I mean, just not known. There's not, nothing that made it yet, at least, where they can have an organized where we can say, look, you can have multiple strategies and you can play with and you can uh, uh, with certain algo by tradings and you can see historical chart. It's actually very, very cool. So it would be, I would say, unique outside of because you want to build a better product aside of being patriotic you also build a better product and i feel that this is where i don't see it in e-trade i don't see it and and there are so many small platforms but in order for you to get on someone that has a good but you have to know that person you don't know the platform the platform itself can be the marketplace for those bots as well I completely agree. And like, I think there are, there's a toolkit for the sophisticated Mm -hmm. investor that's not being really met by the current market. Um, in our sort of first, like I'm an early stage entrepreneur, right? So in our first iteration, we're really focused on, um, kind of those neophyte investors, although we have like a whole series of tool sets for the more sophisticated investor. And on, on that UI, I actually like, I'll put our little, our little platform, our little engine that could up against, all the right. Ameritrades and the Robin Hoods. We've done a couple Good. cool things. Like one of them, um, I think you'll appreciate this is we've created a leaderboard. So everybody comes on the platform and they're in a, a oh. they have an anonymous name, right? And then every day at the close of market and then at the end of every week and actually at the end of every month, we rack and stack them. I love it. All the people on the platform in this good. leaderboard. So you can see like who's number one today, who's number one for the week. And then you can actually click into that person's portfolio and you can see, you know, why is this person up 17% when the S&P is it's down, down yeah. 5%? Right? See- why do they have a 22% relative? But do they have a choose uh, the ability to choose if to show themselves or they not? They do. You can always okay. click it on. So you off. can go uh, private or not. Okay. Right. And it's not, by the way, by dollar amount. So you'll never know if this person yeah. has a million dollar account or a thousand dollar account. But you can right? see, but the, you can see uh, percentage yeah. by percentage. And can you see what they've invested in that? A hundred percent. And why that is so critical is if you think about one of the things that's missing from financial services overall is transparency. Yeah. Right. And this is eroded trust. It's a community. Right? Yeah. How do most people get their their stock advice, right? These days, right? Especially most people who are doing, you know, self-directed investing, right? Wall Street bets, mm-hmm. Reddit, all this stuff like oh yeah, yeah. I have, you know, thousand percent gains, right? That's basically the equivalent of saying I can bench 450. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like you don't really know. Yeah. On our platform, you can actually go in and see like who's doing well and why they're doing well. And I think this is important because that's like real time 
conviction, smart. Yeah. right? And and what people are actually doing. So it becomes this sort of tacit educational Yes, I, I guess, you know, what, what I would what I would say is that if someone that, if say if I want to go and kind of like uh, follow the trade of someone else and that person is okay with that and he gets a particular uh, fee for that and everyone is sharing that, that particular feature would make sense. So a lot of people think, I don't know what he's doing, but I'll just put the money behind him and this is the stop loss. This is the margin. So you're like copy trading. And then something. you copy trade and he gets so a little. I can do even one better. I like the principle, but I think I've expanded it to like it scaled that idea. And okay. the way that I have scaled it is through a collective intelligence portfolio. Okay. So right there on the platform, we have a a guild portfolio, and it's based on this James Sirwicky wisdom of crowns. So we take the top 30 stocks on the guild portfolio. We sort of aggregate them. We put a little mm. special sauce on it, some criteria filter. So you can't have like a penny account yeah. that will throw off the algorithm yeah. or whatever. And then we aggregate this into a dynamic portfolio that's changing every day, right? And this is the idea that none of us is smarter than all of us, so yeah, mm. right? And if yeah. you think about the market itself- like the guild ETF? It, it, we haven't made it an ETF yet, yeah. but that is certainly okay. like you're, you're getting there. Like, yeah, yeah it's certainly <laughs> probably on the horizon okay. somewhere. Okay. But for now, it's just this a collective intelligence portfolio that you can go and follow and learn from. And look, this has been a rough year. You asked me how mm, Guild yeah. is going, right? The name of the game this year Expand is to business. survive, yeah, and not thrive, business. right? And like when everybody else is shuttering their doors, we've been able to grow month over month, yeah. right? But I think part of the reason is that that Guild Collective Intelligence portfolio, and I, I love you guys because like we've gotten way more into the weeds than people yeah. normally would. I can I, tell I like you guys, it. yeah. <laughs> like is is that's that's far outperformed the S&P this year, right? Oh, wow. amazing. In, in a volatile year, right? That's amazing. Yeah, so so we're really proud of it. So we've tried to build just the interface itself. I, I, gotta, I, gotta, I gotta jump in another one yeah. because, uh, when, <laughs> because the thing I got is, his brain okay, yeah. Because yeah, because this is, this is something that, I mean, who doesn't like? Well, I'm sure some don't like talking about finance, but anyway, I do. So <laughs> I would say adding another marketing component because most financiers don't know market marketing. So I think uh, Robinhood made it because they had a better UI than most, and they had a fractional. Yeah, they started. They, look, they were they the were first innovative ones in the and, market yeah, with fractional market. shares. Yeah, but the thing what's missing is kind of like when you look at TikTok, the way they blew up, where they had an easy shareable part. Anything you created on TikTok, share it on Instagram. Today they don't need to do it, but that's what made them a thing, right? So if someone gets, you want to look at the stock, you go and you say, hey, you want to see your current trade? You look at, all right, today I'm I'm twenty percent up or so on. And you need to go and create a share button with API to Instagram where it has a watermark for your platform. That's gonna that's where you that's where you're gonna win. You you make it's a user generated content, and every time when you have a win, oh you just made five percent, boom, share it with your friends, call to action, click. It, it needs to be a one click, just like the TikTok did this. One click share. Share as a story, share as as a, as a, as, a, as a, on the feed, whatever it is. Go share like a portfolio. It is, this is what's gonna go, and everyone's gonna go and look at this. Listen, listen. <laughs> like right now, it's a screenshot. Like I will buy the next bottle of tequila if we can just excerpt this little piece of the conversation. This we'll is send probably it to my co-founder. Like, dude, I think this is exactly right because look, like we live in a shared economy, yeah. right? People want to live in a community yeah. and this is how you create community around investing. It's like you said, like, look, I know it's not the sexiest topic, right? Like when I was in my twenties, I was more focused on gunslinging mm -hmm. than I was on public equities, right? But like, it's People really- People made important. money, it's like a casino. Yeah. People made money and they show it off, would create awareness and everyone that made some money would like to show it off. I'm not trying to put this on a negative way because today people say, hey, show off is bad. Making money sounds bad. Casino sounds bad. But no, this reality, isn't flexing your you, money. Yeah, it's not, it's this not is flexing about being smart, yeah. about making a smart investment. Yeah. And that's a different kind of flexing. You're just removing all the, all the frictions no to friction. go and share it and you yeah. put a call to action. That little tactic, can make a world of a difference. If you are, if do you know the, because you want to create awareness better, faster, and cheaper than your competition. So you use your people, and then you need to give them a name. So if uh, guilds, then guilders or something like that, give them a name for that because that would create a sense of community. Um, ultimately, if you look at, um, it's a small growth hacking tactic. I think the classic example would be where you look at. Uh, I think it was with. Uh, Airbnb, mm -hmm. you know how Airbnb blew up, right? You know the case study, how they made it. Mm. So when Airbnb... Is it Craigslist? 
Yes. So Airbnb had, they were not the only bed and breakfast online, right. but what they did was the, the founders were quarters and they, they made sure that when you list anything on Airbnb, at the end, it's going to say, do you want to add it also on Craigslist? Geotargeted. You would say yes, automatically it would create your entire listing on Craigslist. Said, so, okay, nothing special about that. But it was because you need API for that. And they were the only one doing it. Like, well, what do you mean? I mean, so why didn't they rest do the API? Well, because there was no API for Craigslist. They blueprint the code. They created their own API. They hacked their API. And then what they would do is you would have, it was like 90 something percent of the people that listed anything would automatically be on Craigslist. But guess what? Because Craigslist was the de facto for rental at the time, right. they would rent. And then from there, People on that would see it on Craigslist automatically go on their site and they had a better flow to go and keep them for the next time and so on. And then they became Airbnb and they just suck up and they ate. all the demand from Craigslist yeah. and it was no longer available. Craigslist changed their code, but it was already too late. And now Airbnb is Airbnb. And what's the name of the other ones? Who knows, right? So the idea is that that little tactic, think military-wise, that little tactic, right? So if you think a bomb, a bomb is a tactical weapon. Well, a nuclear bomb is a tactical weapon that can win the war. All the strategies, all the fleets in the world, two bombs, that's it. End of the war, right? So it can, one tactic that can be so powerful, placed right, you can win the war. And you can, from one day to another, because it, once it, explo it explodes, it explodes. And that's how Tic Tac made it. From that particular strategy, if you put that, that weapon into the financial system, you're going to be the TikTok of the financial system. Oh, I'll take that. I'll take that moniker. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, listen, I, I thought I was coming here to dispense knowledge, but I'm very happy to absorb knowledge. And uh, yeah, I think you'll see some integrations like that awesome. in the near future on the platform. I think the, the biggest awesome. takeaway is when you apply some really great marketing tactics to something like this, like, you know, it's going to, it's going to, take over the Robin Hoods of the world because still financial to your point is a very boring industry. And nobody's really, really doing it well. Yeah, a, a, a boring industry, but more importantly, with like a, a lack of trust, right? Yeah. And, and and I think bridging the trust gap with, especially when you're talking yeah. about people's money, is yeah. is the first piece of the equation. Very smart. Okay, where do people go to connect with you, man? Where do people oh, yeah. go to? <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So where do you live? Tell them the address. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we, this is where we started. I live nowhere. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah like that. Elon Musk, right? Yeah. I have no place. You, you can come, find me. You yeah. come but you'll find there. me on the factory floor for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, look, uh, Twitter headquarters. So <laughs> Guild, Guild itself in, in the App Store and Google Play, you can okay. just search Guild Financial, download it. Super cool. easy. Um, and the uh, for myself personally. Uh, IG is kind of, Instagram is kind of my primary platform. Cool. And all, all those things are at Kaj Larson. Okay. I'm, I'm easy to find on social, just like trigger warning. It's mostly me like underwater spear fishing, like in different parts <laughs> of the world, you know, but uh, occasionally dispensing yeah, financial uh, instruments as well. Very good, That's man. Awesome. I appreciate you a lot. Thank yeah. you. Is there anything else you want to drop before we, we close this out? No, I, I'll just say should, you know, should all these, should all media podcasts be done with such good tequila? Thank you. Oh, guys. Man. Yeah, it's, been, <laughs> it's been a pleasure. <laughs> For coming. Yeah. Thank this you for is coming. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, brother. Thank you, man. I appreciate yeah. you a lot. <laughs> That's fun. <laughs>